three, two, one. Roxanne! <laughs> you don't have to put on the red light! That's uh, one of the best covers I've ever heard from oh my God. the film uh, Moulin Rouge! With an exclamation mark. Well, um... Yeah, how do I follow that one up? I'm Alex from IHG. Uh, <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to go with the easy one and whip out the old My I See Sardona cast or something mm. like that, you know. Yeah. Uh, Whatever. But no, you went for Moulin. Is that how you say it? Did we, did we decide how you, how you say it? Because it's like French, obviously. They say Moulin in the film. Moulin. I don't... I th- that seems about right. Moulin. Rouge. Moulin. Le. Yeah, I'm just not even going to try with that one. Moulin. Rouge, <laughs> tabernacle. Um. <laughs> so, uh, are we in that time of the year then, where you just have like an, a, a huge controversy on Twitter? Is it just time with the Oscars now? Is that just like what your reality is, or what? Like, well, it's always just shit from like six plus years ago, and it doesn't seem like anything really like sparked it <laughs> it's just i just we're just it, outside of it just being like oscar season so there's a bunch of like film discussions going on. that's uh, the only like connection i can yeah think i of. don't know <laughs> i have no yeah. idea at this point like yeah I, I don't know how you do it with twitter at this point i just yeah you know sometimes sometimes they just block and ignore but sometimes i clap back and i feel like if people are literally saying that they should kill me that maybe that's an opportunity to be like hey this is not cool like like this is so obviously not cool that you should be on blast for this excuse me Mm -hmm. yeah (laughs) it's like it's it's always been unhinged but this stuff it's like it just feels different now you know, so I don't really like saying stuff on Twitter anymore. I'm more of like a lurker nowadays, but yeah, God, it does just seem so like hostile. Like it's just, it's man, like, that's it's the so whole aggressive. point of the website. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Almost, you know, everything kind of just inevitably turns into its most exaggerated version of itself. We've seen this politically, you know, like what is, mm-hmm. what is politics anymore? It's all just like the most extreme attention grabbing nonsense possible now yeah and so you know you take the defining characteristics of anything like a website what is the most extreme thing about it all of a sudden over time (laughs) it just morphs into only being that and you know of course with how these websites are designed and the algorithms that uh encourage these sorts of things which is why it's the case in the first place a lot of people you know with reasonable opinions or that don't really want to Uh, be the center of attention all the time and don't necessarily get a boner from just tweeting 10,000 times a day and every single one Mm -hmm. is a quote tweet trying to dunk on someone being like I'm more moral than this person and I'm smarter (laughs) than this person and they get you know some people just get a massive boner off of that they kind of drown out everybody else Mm -hmm. yeah it's a classic vocal minority problem and and then other people just don't want to (laughs) participate yeah yeah. You're kind of just watching. And it, it was a slow, like, decline. There was a time where I I did kind of rate Twitter. It was like a nice way to uh, interact with your audience, and it did kind of stay a little bit more in that pocket of your audience instead of, yeah, the algorithm takes message and then delivers it to a bunch of groups that obviously are going to not like it, so then they engage with it, and then you get the dunks. And it's, oh, it's just this maelstrom of shit, like that, <laughs> that absolute yeah. horrible website. Yeah, but. it's fucking weird. People, people like it's it's so bizarre. Like people really gravitate onto to that sort of thing. Oh yeah, like they just jump in from like other communities and shit. Where it's like you don't even have like any kind of accurate idea, even close of like what I am. All you've seen is yeah, like it, it always like boils down to these talking points that are just like parroted and they're, like. I don't know, they don't normally have much backbone. Well, yeah, like there's literally a significant chunk of people that all they know about me is like a brain fart that I had six years ago, plus like someone's uncharitable interpretation of another thing 10 years ago. And mm-hmm. then they, they've they built their entire uh, mental image of like me and my character based off of just those things. And it's like the, cycling through the same fucking like 10 things forever. And it's like, okay, well... 
<laughs> I, I guess I understand why you think I'm this if that's all you're exposed to. But, you know, you can't win everybody. And, you know. It gets elaborate, like some of the, the like fiction that gets like, yeah. wound up being made. You know, the game of like Chinese whispers by the time. Exactly. What they're sharing is just like such nonsense. And it's like <laughs> easy to disprove, but it's more fun, I guess, to like just throw logs on the fire than uh, figure out what's actually going on. It's uh, yeah, it's not only like more fun, but like if somebody had to come to terms with the fact that they're being like an asshole <laughs> yeah. to someone who doesn't deserve it, then the cognitive dissonance is going to have them prefer the reality where I am a bad person. So they latch on to whatever they can to believe that so that they don't have to feel as though they're being an unreasonable person when they say that they should legally be allowed to kill me. <laughs> mm -hmm. some some weird it seems kind of extreme you know it's it, it, I, th I think that's a little much very extreme very hyperbolic when we're talking about like disagreeing with someone's experience on a piece of art maybe maybe like get a fucking reality check at some point yeah why is this thing so high yeah i, I feel like i've said that a lot lately but it's like man, we are talking about movies here yeah There's, there are real things to get upset about and then then one person does it and then people like quote tweet or retweet or whatever and then everybody just joins in you know because mm -hmm. they're like and they'll start the sentence with like "Ooh, while we're dunking on yms here's this yeah, other yeah, yeah. random no unrelated thing and then they'll it'll just be like complete like i don't understand the minds of these people one of them was talking about they they included my review of uh what was that cohen brothers like shakespearean thing and i was saying like, yeah, yeah. hey, I don't, <laughs> I I prefer movies without sh Shakespearean dialect. Still gave it a positive review, loved the cinematography, et cetera, et cetera. But I'm like, uh, yeah, I just like, my brain doesn't process it well. And I have a difficult time understanding what's going on. And their interpretation of that was like, oh yeah, wow. They should like change it to normal <laughs> dialogue in a Shakespearean thing. I'm like, I didn't say change <laughs> it. I'm saying that affected my experience. Like, what, what? So if I, if I show you something like, the human centipede and you're like i don't like scat i'm like yeah what you want to change the scat movie into not a scat movie it's like it's still a legitimate thing <laughs> to mention about your experience there are some things inherent to the to what the movie is trying to be that you can still say you don't prefer that's not saying that you can't make a movie like that right like i just uh, there, there's a very uh pr a lot of people that talk about art don't understand the fundamental concept about conversing about art <laughs> is mm -hmm. that other people can have different experiences. Like they just, that's and, a fundamental yeah. thing that's square one before you start your conversation is being like, Oh, some people have different tastes and might experience things differently. But it's also just like how bad faith. Oh yeah. It is. So why, what, why, why are they assuming like, they're approaching it as if they're coming across and come to these conclusions as if like you actually don't like any movies and this you're just trying to prove something. Well, because all they've seen is just these clips on Twitter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so they form this whole idea from like these two like clips that you have no control over. That have, it's not like all the other clips from every other inverse thing you've said about other movies are being shared about in the same way. It's no. just this small handful, but like. When enough of those are linked together and it's on your timeline and there's an algorithm and all these numbers, like people like, yeah, it just like makes people go mad. Yeah. Well, I think it's also like partially people have built this idea up in their heads about me that I am insisting some sort of authority on how mm. I talk about movies. The only authority that I insist is the authority over my own perspective, over my experience on the film. Constantly, every single fucking review I make, I'm like, hey, maybe this is fine for you. Maybe check it out. The one that, like, I got death threats over, Joyland, I, like, gave it a positive review, and I was just like, mm -hmm. yeah, this is not for me, but it's well made in this sense, and, you know, I didn't like this, or blah, 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 blah. Check it out if you want. It's got some awards at Cannes. It's, you know, it might be up your alley. She fucking, like, one of the people that worked on the film, like, <laughs> is mm -hmm. issuing death threats against me, <laughs> saying, saying they want my head on a pike and should legally be allowed to kill this white boy. I don't know what that has to do with anything, but... Well, it's very weird, like. Man. What what I, I what what world, what reality? Like it, I just I I can't. It's so bizarre. Um, and I want to point out, there's a lot of people on the internet that I don't like, 
And there's a lot of people that I'll notice on Twitter. I'm like, oh, you're the main character today, right? <laughs> yeah, I yeah. don't. I don't use that as an opportunity to be like, ooh, since I'm in this safe zone where I can dunk on this person because they're the main character today, I'm going to do that too. Do you know how much of a fucking turd you are? (laughs) Like, like, (laughs) look, I don't like Quentin reviews either. I'm not going to just look at the fucking, the, the, (laughs) oh, everybody's dunking on him and be like, hey, here's my two cents about this guy. What a slimy piece of shit. You all have to realize just how fucking awful awful you are when you participate in that shit and when you do participate in that shit and you're like ooh ooh this is my opportunity to dunk on them because I feel safe doing that I li- <laughs> I just like you deserve it you deserve it I hope it happens to you I hope you learn your lesson the hard way y- you know it, like it, it, yeah it's so like juvenile in high school um, you have no idea <laughs> like, yeah this is we live in a society come on <laughs> come on what is wrong with you is like everybody turned into baby brain? Is everybody just a baby now? Like yes, or or a Russian bot. <laughs> yeah. Well, here's the thing: is is you know we just mentioned this earlier. It's not that everybody's a baby. It's that that's what you see on the timeline. Is that everybody mm. tweeting <laughs> is a baby? And every there's a lot of normal, rational people that don't want to be involved in that kind of drama, and so you just don't see them tweeting. Mm-hmm. You just don't see them. And so all you see, it's, and then it affects your perception of reality in the world. And then to a lot of people, it becomes like, oh, this is an acceptable thing to do. I feel safe doing this. Right? Yeah. Yeah. It's like manufactured outrage. Yeah. Yeah. It feeds into itself. Yeah. What's that stat where like nowadays in the first half an hour of our our day, we're getting bombarded with more information than like entire generations previous like, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know it's weeks or months it would take for you to absorb this kind of level of information so of course we're just going nuts <laughs> yeah yeah a lot of a lot of <laughs> the internet the internet's funny the internet's funny <laughs> yeah when it's not being scary it can be pretty funny <laughs> yeah yeah i i mean done it how, how many years I, I think i'll be okay <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> well, here's the thing is the more the more that it happens, the more comfortable I am knowing that these people are just like they're fucking nuts and that they're yeah. you can't get through to them. And, you know, it's not it's not about so it like doesn't bug you. It doesn't it doesn't bring down your day. Seeing it bugs see. me less every time. Uh huh. Yeah. I go, yeah. They got nothing on the line. I guess they got. You know, it's just random randos, anons on Twitter. Like, how much really, really, how much credence can you give? It's just anonymous, like, shit. But it could be a 12 year old. Even if it's not randos, it doesn't even matter. Well, yeah. Yeah. You know, like, if if someone wants, if I had a brain fart six plus years ago and someone wants to dunk on it or whatever, like, Mm -hmm. there was like a part in the, like, I did a review of Game Night. And yeah, yeah. this is one that just people let, like that again, this is like six years the ago. Three for one joke, right? Yeah, yeah. And so I I would have to rewatch my review and rewatch the film to like really get into like what exactly my criticism was and what exactly was wrong about the criticism. People are saying I missed the joke. I think that that is entirely possible, but I just I would have to like rewatch both of those things to to be like, okay, mm-hmm. was my was my criticism that it wasn't a joke or was my criticism just that it was like a bad product placement? Because even if it is a joke, which it seems like it is, it's still a bad product placement, right? So either way, you know, I watch that clip or at least parts of the clip that people are reposting. I come off as a little like, you know, come the fuck on, you know, like my, I I, I don't know if I do that to that extent anymore, right? Like everybody's kind of like a changing, growing person. There's no set, style that is forever and there's you know and things that i create i'm always finding ways to like improve and uh correct upon myself and be introspective and self-critical etc etc with that clip the director (laughs) found it that day and retweeted it with just some like crying laughing emojis Mm -hmm. which i think is funny and i think is totally justified because if, if i were a director and i saw you know at least his perspective of me is probably literally just through those like uh, weird dunks on Twitter, right? Like, I don't know if yeah, he's yeah. ever watched like an actual video. I would totally retweet that shit. That seems funny. 
And that would be like a satisfying thing if I like made a movie and like, haha, look at this. Someone looks stupid and they had an issue with my movie. Then that makes the movie look better or whatever. Mm-hmm. Ignoring the fact that I gave it a positive review, said it was, you know, great cinematography, surprisingly great cinematography. I think I gave it a, either, I don't remember the rating I gave it, but it was a, yeah, it was a, a good film. movie. Yeah, it was a good movie. Yeah, yeah, cute. So that's not a rando nobody for sure. But I don't like, I don't have any ill will or resentment towards the director for retweeting something like that because he's directly involved like that's his movie and that seems like you know i would do that <laughs> yeah and well like the comments were just like emojis too it's not like yeah, he's yeah. calling for anything extreme or <laughs> yeah and what's kind of funny is like these old these really old reviews of mine i can look at some of these out of context and kind of get at what people think of me because it's almost like a stereotypical thing that remember how I was saying everything becomes its most exaggerated version of itself over time. Yeah. There's a lot of, there's a lot of like channels out there that because I've been doing this for so long that I've inspired some for good, some for bad. Uh, there's Mm -hmm. some people that have taken inspiration from me and done like really great things. There's some people that have taken inspiration from me and, uh, you know, maybe have been kind of turds on the internet, but there's, there's a certain type of like, idea of a reviewer that's like only looking to be negative for clicks and i got and as soon as obviously as soon as uh all this like recent twitter outrage or whatever we want to call it happened i was getting a bunch of comments being like well you know people brigaded the subreddit (laughs) and Uh we're like leaving comments like oh you're just gonna have to come to terms with the fact that you're a hack and that you you make fake opinions on videos uh, for engagement or whatever. I'm like, damn, some people really believe that. Like, I'm really passionate about the art that I connect with. I'm really not passionate about the art that I don't connect with, for sure. <laughs> but yeah. I mean, like, that's a part of having strong opinions and strong experiences and being uh, at least confident about your own experience is, you know, like, you're going to connect with some things and not others. And, you know, like, it, it's whatever these people think of me, it doesn't change the fact that, you know, I've got like countless directors that have thanked me for covering their work that continue to give me screeners because they're confident enough in their own work that they're not scared <laughs> of what I have to say about it because they know that they're making art that connects with me and they're consistent and they they actually they know what their style is. They know that I connect with it and that I appreciate these things about it. You know, Disney is not sending me screeners, that's for sure. <laughs> but but there's independent artists that are, appreciate the fact that I'm putting a lot of eyes on them that have uh, thanked me for, you know, pimping it out at the right time and saying that it was like the best financial decision for them to not sell their film and for them to own it independently. So yeah, it doesn't, you know, if the director of Game Night has a version of who I am in his head, that's not the real version of me, it doesn't really matter. We're probably never going to interact in real life ever. Most of my issue is just with People who it I don't understand. It, it seems like it's more personal to them <laughs> with how they interact with me than the director of an actual movie <laughs> that I criticized. Right? Like his mm-hmm. comment was just like lying, crafting, <laughs> lying, crafting, crying, <laughs> laughing emojis. Whereas like other people are like literally like trying to paint a picture that I'm a bad person who deserves to be harassed or killed, which seems like crazy because a, a lot of these people are just not even related to these they they just hate that i exist based on like these false ideas of who i am or like maybe just uncharitable ideas of who i am like it's yeah very bizarre it's, that's the that's the part that like bugs me it's the the bad faith uncharitable interpretation of it where it's like yeah it does become just these these grand narratives and i suppose it is kind of like I don't know, people like equating all these kind of channels because it's, it's, it's common to see on Twitter, like people go on brigades against like cinema sense. That's like a big example in the, in the movie community as far as like content is concerned and people, they like criticizing cinema sins with, for the formulaic nature and kind of the hollow criticisms and this kind of stuff. But like it, it bleeds out sometimes and people, just because CinemaSins exists and these types of channels exist and because there are bad faith channels that are kind of like more machines that just are on the content grind for the sake of it, that doesn't mean 
every channel operates that way or, Mm -hmm. you know, like it's. Yeah. And even CinemaSins gets a lot of really over-exaggerated criticism. Like people will say that he ruined film criticism. (laughs) I'm like, what? That's hilarious when people say that. Like as if he's controlling (laughs) other people to feel certain ways about films. And as if people take his opinion seriously and don't just watch his videos to just see an abbreviated version of a movie that they don't want to buy. (laughs) <laughs> right <laughs> like exactly yeah people people get really hysterical over this sort of shit and they'll look at they'll look at my community and like the fact that like i don't know the comments during some watch alongs or like some responses in my subreddit about like certain things and you know there's a lot of fucking movies like people people will we've already posted the new sardonic cast you know people disagree mm-hmm. with me on dune part one they're a part of my audience they disagree with me that's totally fine that's valid but there are a significant amount of people in my audience that will because <laughs> they agree with me, not because I'm some sort of like authority that they have to believe, but because they already agree with me. And that's probably why a lot of these people are watching my channel is because I feel like a breath of fresh air to them that might not enjoy the new Pixar movie or, you know, that might uh, really love fucking tar, you know, and that might place that higher than something like uh, Killers of the Flower Moon or something. Right. Yeah. You know, it, it, people people have this weird sense of, like, action versus reaction or, like, causality. What What is the... What are, what are the words? Oh, fuck. What am I... I'm looking for that word. Mm. People should know what I'm talking about. But, like, it's it's a misunderstanding of what is causing what. Like, my audience doesn't necessarily agree with my opinions because I said them, but because I've grown an audience of people that agree with me. <laughs> Right. Like if you Mm -hmm. like imagine imagine somebody saying that about like political channels, obviously people that are more left leaning are going to follow left leaning political channels. It's not like, ooh, you only agree with this take because you're subscribed to them and that this enforces all your beliefs. It's like, no, they've built an audience of people that, you know, trust their opinion because they already agree with a lot of what they have to say and it connects with them. So, I, yeah, it's it either reveals some sense of like ignorance or stupid stupidity it either reveals some sense of ignorance or stupidity about like just this naive idea of how people's brains work or that's how their brains work and they don't understand that other people's brains don't work that way right sometimes an accusation can be a confession and if they think that everybody's brain works in the sense of like ooh, you just have an authority figure and you just listen to daddy about that then i have to believe that either they're like really dumb (laughs) and just don't understand that that's not how their own brain even works or their brain works that way. And they just don't understand that other people's don't. Yeah. Yeah. It's in a way you can almost read the, the response and the obsessive behavior of your opinions as a compliment, you know, like the the fact that (laughs) your opinion on a movie, which we have established in this conversation, it's fairly low stakes as far as things are concerned to have these people in sense, making threads, talking about your opinion on it like <laughs> oh yeah i mean like they're yeah. the ones that are making me an authority figure on it exactly yeah they're just reinforcing the exact thing that <laughs> by acting as if my opinion like is having some sort of weight right like yeah i'm a guy on the internet i'm strong i, I feel strongly about my perspective and i will argue my perspective and i you know if it, most of my arguments with people are about them trying to invalidate my perspective not necessarily me saying that a movie is objectively this or anything like that. It's about people trying to invalidate my experience with the movie. No, I will I will fight tooth and nail verbally <laughs> yeah. about my own experience with the movie, and I feel strongly about that. And people can either take it or leave it. Nobody has to watch my videos. And there are a good chunk of people that do value my experience. I get messages all the time from people saying, you know, like, uh, there's a handful of, like, comedic film review channels or meme channels or like, you know, overall sort of like negative vibe on movies or not necessarily even overall, but like that's the main selling point of the channels. Like here's my breakdown, the fucking, I'm going to go full autism on the Lion King here. Mm -hmm. And I'm going to, I'm going to (laughs) like, I'm going to talk about fucking everything. (laughs) That's the selling (laughs) point. But I've gotten so many fucking messages from people and, you know, we know that this is the case. Just everybody in my community can vouch for me on this. Well, maybe not everybody, but a good enough amount of people that like what separates me from a lot of these other like uh, I'm just going to like dump on a Marvel movie sort of channel things is 
is that I'm <laughs> is that I'm promoting a lot of like really great, valuable, independent film that a lot of people would not have heard of otherwise. Mm -hmm. And that I'm actually helping a lot of smaller artists. Am I helping smaller artists that I don't connect with? Not really, maybe debatably, if it's a movie that people never would have heard of anyway, and I'm putting it on some people's radars, even if I'm shitting on it, that's some sort of promotion. But I, I yeah, I, for, for the things that I really connect with, I think that my experience and my overall, I guess, impact on that type of media has been has been positive and i've there's yeah there's artists that i really connect with that if i go to one of their shows it's like just a bunch of my fans <laughs> well not just mm -hmm. but like you know i'm or more likely to see one of my fans at a screening for like yeah, hundreds of beavers or like a matt johnson film or like a, a jim cummings film or you know like a lot of these artists that you know they don't owe their careers to me it's them doing it it's them making the films perhaps maybe them being successful would have taken slightly longer it doesn't really matter but either way there are genuine artists that appreciate me covering their films and that yeah it i it whatever version of me people have on twitter it doesn't change that fact and i am confident about who i am and uh, my favorite screenwriter said he likes my videos and that he thinks that I'm smart. And uh, I, I don't know. I think there are some people that look at something like that and look at the fact that there are respected artists that don't hate me <laughs> <laughs> and they feel some sense of perhaps insecurity about it because there's a lot of uh, people that are trying to be artists that don't know how to be and uh, are upset that nobody is taking them seriously you know, a lot of these, you know, if you if you go to the Twitter profiles of a lot of these people, they're their own people with their own reviews that have like 50 subscribers and are yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of butthurt. So it's a like, oh, my letter. Nobody takes me seriously on my letterbox. Mm -hmm. It's like, OK, you might be projecting a little. You might you might yeah. be upset that people don't take you seriously. And that might be inf influencing your perspective of me when I'm I'm not insisting any sort of authority other than the fact that there's some people that connect with my shit. And that in of itself, if we consider that to be an authority, sure. But it's certainly not like an academic one or anything. Yeah. And that that whole like Twitter overlap, I know depending on the year and what, what conversations are happening, people feel more like Twitter's real life or not real life. Um, but I don't know. It's this kind of thing that does remind you. Yeah, it's like a siloed off like place that doesn't really exist it doesn't really affect a lot of what's actually nobody says this shit to me in like, person <laughs> exactly yeah like <laughs> it feels real in the moment and when you're seeing these numbers attached to these things but yeah then you close your phone and don't think about it again it's like oh yeah the, the people in my life are not saying this stuff like it's yeah. just completely silent it doesn't exist anywhere in, outside of this digital plane yeah. it it does and it doesn't it can it can get to the point, you know, like if you if you, people are canceled for like some serious shit, you'll see them get doxxed and shit like that's when it enters oh, like yeah. your real life. I don't think <laughs> I should hope that that's not going to happen to me over me saying that I don't connect with Shakespearean dialogue or that I misinterpreted <laughs> a joke six years ago on a movie that I gave a positive review anyway or like whatever. I don't know. It's going through these motions of just like, oh, okay, it's this exact clip again, and I guess mm -hmm. it's a slow day on Twitter, and somebody needs a main character today. Like, I don't know. Yeah, just it's, another thing it to seems so over. silly. Yeah. Oh well, free promo, I guess. I guess. <laughs> I guess my subscriber count went up, so there you go. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The Oscars happened. We can give a little quick. Uh, we did it. Yeah. Shall I? What sort of kind of bullet point? Go yeah. Through yeah. The, you don't have to go the, through like all the nominees. Let's see if you. Um, no, no. I was just going to go through the winners. Um, yeah. The and wieners. The, the, category. the Oscars yeah, wieners. Let's go, let's go through those Oscar wieners. What does it say here? The 96th Oscar Academy Awards. 96 years in a row. Um, so, yeah. Actor in a leading role. Starting off with Killian Murphy. Not really a big surprise. I feel like a lot of people saw this coming. He was winning in uh, the award shows beforehand so it wasn't too shocking to me and yeah. also c c deserved it it's been a long time coming honestly like top level 
like the, as far as like a list of Oscar wins, like this is such an inoffensive, like if not fairly solid list of films. I thought mm-hmm. like, in the end, um, nothing too crazy. Yeah, in all the years, like there's nothing really stands out like previous years. Like what? That's odd. Yeah. Okay. Well, I <laughs> my Maestro should have won all the awards. I was oh, I was very happy yeah. about that. Yeah, not yeah, a that was a fun one. No Maestro. I bet no one was. Is has anyone been mad at you about what you said about Maestro? No, I like that. Yeah, everybody feels that. fucking vindicated, right? <laughs> if I said that about a movie that people fucking loved, then I'd have another Twitter thread. But you know, it's yeah. just a, sometimes it's just whether or not people are agreeing with me at the time. The one f- this is the film that can bring everyone together. Yeah, Maestro. yeah. <laughs> the my general feeling over the entire Oscar winners this year was there was a list of things that were expected to win. Out of the things that won that weren't expected, it was the better choice anyway. Yeah. The surprises were nice surprises. There were no bad surprises, which was nice. Yeah, that's a good way of being. Since we're on the best actor category, Mm. Leo's performance was my favorite thing about Killers of the Flower Moon, and he didn't get a nom. Bradley Cooper got a nom. It it didn't take anything (laughs) in the end, did it? Um, Bradley Cooper did get a nom. No. That is embarrassing, and I definitely know which performance I prefer. But of course, yeah, that is. <laughs> I'm raining it in. They played that <laughs> clip during the Oscars. They played that like in, in the lead up to like one of the categories for the film. Embarrassing. That's crazy. That's really funny. Just completely embarrassing. All of that, but uh, unlike the winner of actor in a supporting role, Robert Downey Jr. Um, also expected, again, yeah. Again, expected, not surprising. There was speaking of Twitter, there were a few, a, a few like kind of desperate attempts of like trying to force some kind of like drama around events from this. Oh, really? This year's Oscars. And, oh, well, not yeah. for that category though. Um, well, there was something around like people were trying to make out that Robert Downey was being res- disrespectful to. Uh, oh yeah, because he missed the guy's handshake, Kiwi Kwan. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, from everything everywhere. <laughs> My um, God, you, you take like a like, tiny what? fucking moment of someone's life, like you're on camera. How how much of your life, right? So, like yeah. I'm streaming fucking twenty four seven or whatever. And how are you so confident to put intent on that? Like how, you don't know, <laughs> you don't know shit. They're they're looking for these because I think it makes them feel better about themselves. You know, there must be something like that. Yeah, if, if they can just like create that reality. And uh, yeah, on the kind of similar lines, there was a mini non-troversy about the actress in a leading role, who was Emma Stone, who won for that, for poor things. Very deserved, in my opinion. Definitely Same. Who I probably would have picked out of that list there, but of course, the minor controversy was that Gladstone it was didn't expected, win, yeah. Um, or was, yeah, somewhat expected. Um, but I don't know. I looked at like the betting markets for this, and they were like pretty much the same. So, yeah. like, I don't know if, it, like, Emma Stone wasn't unexpected. I think that people were just really hyped for Lily to win because of the, you know, topic of the film and the fact yeah, that she would have been the first Native American actress to win. Like, people love milestones like that. I don't think that it's never going to happen, right? There will be plenty of opportunity in the future for Native American actresses to win yeah. Best Actress, so... I don't think it's like, oh, this was the only time or anything. And she did a great hope, job yeah. in the film. She just, did do a very good job, and I fucking... hope she's able to get more gigs in the future yeah. as a result of being in the film and being nominated. Maybe. Yeah, I'm sure she will. Maybe the win could have helped, but I mean, at the end of the day, to me, if what we're talking about is an award show celebrating the best performances, I, I just thought Emma Stone was incredible. I um, mean, poor she, things. Her, and... her role required so much care. For what Care, she was portraying, commitment. It, yeah, the, the, what was required of her for the role easily could have turned into like one of the worst performances of all time. Like, yeah, yeah, it's, the risk it, like of it. like fucking uh, I am Sam or some shit, right? It could have been looked <laughs> yeah, back on easily. as like what the right, like when you're portraying mm-hmm. a character with like essentially a child brain, like baby brain, adult body for a significant portion of the film. And you're trying to navigate the physicality of that and the mannerisms and and the the voice and having like a consistent growth of the character in those ways over the course of the film. 
not to discredit Lily Gladstone or anything, because she did a great job. And if Emma Stone wasn't there, then I mean, like, she would have won. <laughs> it's just Probably, yeah. Emma Stone's yeah. performance in this year was just... They, it, there's, It's not unjustified at all. People that are acting like, oh, it's a, this was just some sort of <laughs> scam. Like, I, I, the, the, there's yeah. legitimate reasons to agree that she was the best performance and, of those yeah and poor so. things did i don't know won a lot of awards so now it's like it quickly became the race of like when everything everywhere started winning a bunch of awards mm, yeah like, we gotta like <laughs> go against it now in some form like oh now, now there's all these weird conversations about the it, <laughs> poor things being like a pro pedo movie and like i mean i expected so. that much of people <laughs> from the moment i saw the movie I'm like this is a this is a challenging film that's clearly not promoting. Well, that's, that. that's the part that's crazy <laughs> to me. Is like it, I agree it is challenging, but that part of it is not challenging as far as like any complexity or question marks as far as to what it's like pointing to or like endorsing to have enough comprehension and know that that's not <laughs> like the goal of the film or what it's saying. Like yeah, that's not a yes. challenging thing for people with out baby brains <laughs> but but i don't have that much faith in the average audience member and so this is completely unsurprising yeah yeah <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah it was that one there was i don't know this has been going on for years and years the the three billboards drama that happened with that film what was the drama was like a race the, the sam rockwell character is he was like racist or something. He's got racist. The character is oh. racist in some form. So people were getting upset that that's by yeah, depicting not a even racist character. That's the first. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's yeah. It's kind of an ongoing theme. This kind of media literacy thing. We're not allowed to talk about anymore. But uh. <laughs> if, well, fuck. If we're gonna go that route, then fucking Scorsese wrote characters for himself to play in his films to say the n word. So all of his movies should not <laughs> win awards. You can't give an award to Lily now. Sorry. <laughs> Because it's oh, directed man. by a racist, because he wrote the character to say the N-word, and he decided to play it. Right? Yeah. Right? How far are we going to like, go? I like, but like, don't get me wrong, I like being angry over things, but I like be being angry over things that matter. It's like, can we just outrage over, let's just, let's just chill, man. Can we just relax? <laughs> nah. God, it's so <laughs> annoying. But um, yeah, actress in a supporting role next then, uh, winner being divine joy randolph for the hold overs. davine actually davine davine so was, um yeah i mean she was great she did do a good job yeah I, she was my pick honestly for the that category with all the nominees she was definitely my yeah. pick yeah she'd probably be my pick too actually that or emily blunt i think i only would have had raised my eyebrow at the uh america ferrera uh if, if that was yeah i don't i that was a weird one to even nominate honestly yeah weird nomination but didn't win so whatever uh yeah, and some people disagree but yeah next one animated feature film boy in the heron kind of unsurprisingly took it away but de uh, not deserved in my opinion um i've, I've re-watched the boy in the heron um since mm -hmm. seeing it in canada um i lowered my rating slightly there's a lot i love about the film but man I just, the plot is like really difficult to figure out like what it's going for what it's, what it's trying to say and that is probably the main reason I would still heavily be like Across the Spider-Verse is a better film in my mind than The Boy and the Heron Spider-Verse is the better film for me yeah uh, I liked Robot Dreams a lot I know you didn't connect with it as much but yeah I didn't like Robot Dreams glad um, I got a nom yeah Elemental is one of the worst movies ever made I d Elemental being nominated is yeah, that's there like there was a better Disney movie to nominate that year that was still also <laughs> shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, agreed, agreed. Did uh, you watch it? You watched Elemental? Oh, I saw Elemental. Oh, um, God. God, yeah. Now you put me in the position of trying to remember anything about Elemental. Uh, I definitely did watch it. It's so, like yeah, just the worst setup. Like they used to be like Pixar used to be such like masters of. Uh, like concept yeah like the concept was the movie in a sense like they had like they're just like in one image they could like sell a film of like oh that's a fun concept it's we the bug story this time it's we the toys it's the fish blah, blah, blah. we have a hook but this is like what you got to sit someone down for like 20 minutes to even describe what the concept even is or like what even there, there isn't anything cool about it like, <laughs> even with the concept they don't do anything with the concept other than puns <laughs> no nothing 
Literally nothing, yeah. So it stupid. It's just straight up puns. Yeah, the, we're just... the visual, the character design, like all of it was just like, what? <laughs> this is, this does not feel like Pixar. Um, but We're going to make an allegory for are. prejudice again. No one, no one's ever done that. The yeah, the metaphors and the it all like flashed really badly. Um, yeah, and just like character design, those two, cancer just really unlikable lead two characters, the fire and water characters. This, God, they sucked. <laughs> like, there were no great voice performances. There, were, there was no voice talent no. in the film. No, I yeah, I, I really don't know what they were going for with that. Um, and it wound up making a lot more money than The Good Dinosaur, which is the director's previous Pixar outing. Um, so somehow I managed to wind up making some money in the end. Uh, not deserved, but... Did did you clap when Clyde came on the screen? Uh, of course, yeah. Well, after all that marketing build yeah. up and hype, I was... Dude, Clyde. I got my clawed pop vinyl. I got my clawed posters... Hopefully the Disney Plus Claude show comes mm, out, yeah. comes together, yeah, yeah, yeah. What are we talking about? Uh, <laughs> your your Funko Clyde. <laughs> oh, very embarrassing. International feature zone of interest is worth mentioning, if only for the fact that there's now like an open letter condemning Jonathan Glazer's acceptance speech, which I mean was probably the most uncontroversial way he could have framed the whole you know, Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Yeah, because I hadn't, I hadn't seen that clip um, when I woke up on the, the day of the Oscars, because uh, it, it airs at like three in the morning for the UK, for the Brits out there or whatever. Um, and so when I wake up, I see uh, all these articles, like Jonathan Glazer's comments at the Oscars are causing controversy, and Eli yeah. Roth is getting upset, and people are all signing this thing. It's like, oh my God, what, yeah. what could he possibly have said? How bad is this? And then you watch no. it, and you're right. It's very just like, oh, this was very like, like, I don't even know how you could get upset over this. It was extremely kind of bureaucratic and respectful. Yeah, and like he acknowledged the victims of October 7th, too. He didn't, like, he's not like yeah. a fucking, one of those crazies that like... He didn't seem to hold up any flag or anything. He was just kind of like, yeah, the point of the movie was this. And you know, dehumanization. He yeah, he kept it on the dehumanization angle. Yeah. We're seeing some of that today. It's not, it's not something that everybody is like exempt from and that is like in the past historically. Like we can see examples of it. What the fuck? Like Eli Roth, you dumb piece of shit. <laughs> 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 He's so stupid. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he's been very embarrassing on Instagram. He's made one good movie, and even that movie is not like a masterpiece. Which one's that? Cabin Fever. I liked. Oh, interesting. Yeah, I like okay. Cabin Fever a lot. I know you didn't. Mm. Yeah, I remember. I remember hating. That. I recent. I recently went through your letterboxed. I saw oh, that okay. it was uh, in the one through my Eli Rosk rankings. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Yeah, maybe I'll have to recommend that at some point. It's been a while. But, mm. uh, yeah. Uh, next up, well, actually, maybe I should just throw out uh, the the sound win, of course, for Zone of yeah. Interest. Yeah. I've already thrown that good, out, which I thought was mention. very deserved. Uh, I actually rewatched Zone of Interest a weekend or two ago. Yeah, I need to. Uh, yeah, I think it, it hits better a second time. You know what it's going for. You understand that kind of detached style um what it's what it's selling um much more with much more immediacy yeah the sound design is like haunting it's yeah technically uh it's just so foreboding so horrifying um subtle yeah on a technical aspect the sound definitely did deserve a win there you know what's um, fucking crazy no cinematography nom for zone <laughs> Yeah, well, I've just got that up now. Um, you know what got a nom? Uh, Maestro. Maestro. <laughs> yeah, true. That 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 is the big like the big standout, I guess. It's just Maestro. What are you doing here? Every, every <laughs> snub, you can easily just bump out Maestro, and yeah. you have you have a good list. There's a, yeah, there's a very good option for every place Maestro is in. Um, but the the actual winner of cinematography was Oppenheimer. Mm -hmm. Again, not too much of a surprise. Um, I probably would have given it to Poor Things Same. in that category, but I can't really get upset over Oppenheimer either. I did like the presentation of it. Uh, costume design. 
Again, not surprising. Poor things coming in there. That's yeah. People were anticipating have. Barbie for that and uh, production. Yeah, there was kind of a lot less Barbie than I thought there was going to be, and I don't know. I'm I'm fine with that personally. I don't think it sure. necessarily was yeah. Oscar winning or needed to be jerked off to that level. It has some fun things about it, but I mean, again, costume design far better in Poor Things in my mind. Mm-hmm. Uh, it won a, a song. And it was for the wrong song, as in I I liked I'm just Ken a lot more <laughs> the, than that is yeah. What was I, I actually remember for. that song? I, I don't remember the Billie Eilish one exactly. Remember we we had fucking Jay McCarroll on our podcast, mm-hmm. like a great composer by the way. That was the song that yeah. stuck out to him too. Like it's so much more catchy and memorable, and like such so much more of like an actual musical number. But like. Damn, I, I get people are fans of Billie Eilish. It doesn't but, have but Billie in it. The, the, the Billie song is like, it's like we've heard it before. Like, oh yeah, a lot. For sure. <laughs> I would have I would have been cool with uh, Killers of the Flower Moon song, the a song for my people. Yeah, yeah, that would have been cool. I thought that was like a really interesting challenge for a composition is essentially creating a new song that still felt like authentic and traditional mm-hmm to yeah, that tribe that's a good point. i think that that was yeah i think that that's like a pretty unique pick in there and i would not have been upset with that win yeah i definitely prefer that over the eilish win but again not surprising nolan coming in snapping up the best director or directing award again not surprising it's kind of the oppenheimer sweep documentary feature film any thoughts on 20 days in maripol i mean taking that my one? my favorite uh from the list would have been four uh, sorry the eternal memory and then four daughters yeah four daughters was very good and i didn't watch to kill a tiger or bobby wine bobby wine looked boring and to kill a tiger i just ran out of time cool uh editing another win for oppenheimer there um i you know probably not what what i would have given it but you know yeah i think it's fine the editing is like one of my criticisms not that that it's like unprofessional but just like the choices of what like the whole thing was edited like a trailer for the first like like 30 minutes like breakneck yeah yeah i get i get what you mean it was like a kind of mess in a way um okay yeah yeah i'm torn because i only seeing it once i didn't notice that but i also did kind of like the breakneck pace it did add to the movie that is just like just constant science, constant exposition. We got so much to communicate with. Yeah. It's I, weird. But I'm torn, yeah. I'll see how it flows on a rewatch. Yeah. Um, makeup and hairstyling then. Another one for poor things. Not surprising. Woo! Again, what I would yep, yeah, uh, suggest myself. Uh, music, original score, Oppenheimer. Nah. I like the score of Oppenheimer. I'm, I can't be upset about this. Um, poor things was fucking way better. Yeah, I think poor things are probably perhaps edge it out if i was voting on it myself but but the name's not ludwig it is not ludwig (laughs) and that was another little mini drama was him saying in his acceptance speech about the his parents thanks parents for not buying me video games Um, so then so then gamers got mad (laughs) that's great (laughs) excuse me um yeah and then you got the original song best picture as well for oppenheimer just totally sweeping here. Production design for poor things. So it was, yeah, it was mostly Oppenheimer and poor things. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we did sound zone of interest. Visual effects. The one Godzilla minus yeah. one win. I, st- I still haven't um, got around to seeing that. Oh. But I'm excited too. I think you'd like it probably. Um, I liked the previous. Uh, I liked Shin Godzilla a lot. I, th- I love that design. And it's very different. Um, okay, interesting. Yeah, cool. Godzilla minus uh, one is kind of like an homage to like the original. The old. Godzilla. Sc- okay, cool. It's like. Yeah. Old but modern at the same time. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And like the visual effects are great, especially for the budget. Like they definitely had like a like a solid understanding of visual effects. Yeah. Wes Anderson won for short film and didn't show up, which is great. <laughs> he was Neither busy. Did, uh, Miyazaki <laughs> for the boy in Heron. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah. Did you see there was like a like one of those like parody article things they made a tweet and they were like Wes Anderson reportedly did not show up because he was busy building this Lego set and like listed a specific (laughs) one that's a good one (laughs) Uh, there was writing adapted screenplay of which American fiction won Um, I still haven't 
I've seen about half of American fiction. I like what I've seen. It's okay. I don't th- it's you know it's fine. Um, exactly it's kind of what you expect <laughs> from the trailer. Um, I, I did though like Cord Jefferson's speech with his comment on because we've been talking about these movie budgets and getting inflated, inflated to this obscene mm, level. True, yeah, I, li- yeah. I liked his comment saying instead of one two hundred million dollar movie, why don't we break that up and you know, sure, let's get four forty million dollar so on and so on. And it's uh, a good idea to let's put experiment out. with that. Um, cause yeah, I, it does just feel crazy, unsustainable. And I feel like, yeah, a, a $40 million film, you know, like an everything everywhere type doing well, doing something creative, doing something risky and making a nice amount of money instead of all the money. That seems to be the thing. It's like, they want all the money. So everything has to be these big make or break investments. It's like, yeah, of, of course, if you have a string of them, then you're fucked. And that's yeah, like what's happening. <laughs> Disney's track record last year <laughs> yeah. was not great. So it's so like, yeah, you don't need they lost to be the spending plot. those numbers. That's I'm with Jefferson on that. Let's chill. <laughs> um and I guess finally, yeah, writing, original screenplay. And that's me of a fall. Hell yeah. Uh, got a nod there, which I'm glad it won something. Yeah. Um And let's thank the French government. <laughs> <laughs> for not not submitting it for international feature which was fucking annoying oh is that why it's not in there i, yeah, I didn't well, consider that yeah you're so right so the <laughs> justine Trier during her con speech said some things that were like critical of the french government and so then they were like oh, that- and then they well because <laughs> that's how international feature works is the government of the country submits the film and they can only submit one per year because there couldn't possibly be more than one good movie per year from a country that's not America that you would want to include on international God, that's bizarre. So this would have been the, every single fucking year for the past like 10 years, the international feature film, it's always been like, oh, I know which one's going to win because it's the one that's nominated for best picture. Yeah. This would have been yeah, the yeah. one fucking year where two <laughs> of the nominees were nominated for best picture. So there would actually be some debate over which one would win. Mm-hmm. Which would have been nice for, you know. That would have been nice, yeah. 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 But yeah, I li- loved the screenplay. thought it was great. May, December, its only nomination was screenplay. I think easily could have gotten a bunch of other noms. I loved that movie. It took me by surprise, honestly. It was like... You loved it. Yeah. Really? Yeah, yeah. I loved it a lot. Really substantive. Really meta, but like purposefully meta, not like Deadpool meta. You know, a lot to chew on and think about. Yeah. Did you find, I was saying a lot of people finding it sort of humorous. Did you find humor in there? Like in a like dark, what way? A dark humor. A lot of people have been commenting on it. I've seen it. I mean, I, that's not really what my takeaway was as much. I thought, yeah, the way it was dealing with this complicated subject matter and yeah, the meta layers were interesting in the, mm-hmm. the lead two performances and that kind of arc of the... Especially the younger guy, um, something disturbing about that and something yeah. true that it's commenting on. Um, I don't know. I didn't, I definitely didn't love it though. Um, sure. Couldn't quite put my finger on it. I was just like, I like what it was doing. I, I did like some of that coldness. I liked a lot. There was a lot of great dialogue and a lot of great conversations and acting. Um, but it, as far as like an emotional punch or impact, like it didn't stay with me. It hasn't. It hasn't stayed with me compared to some of these, like a past lives, which you could you could call fairly snubbed. Or uh, I even think like Bo is afraid. Like as far as twenty twenty three, like I don't know. We're gonna be talking about Moulin Rouge soon. It's like, well, if that's allowed to have like six Oscar noms, like, <laughs> why, why can't? <laughs> anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself. Uh, yeah, yeah. I don't know. I mean, we already talked about everything for the yeah, Oscar. yeah, yeah. So overall, not a bad oscars i guess yeah i can't get upset really over this list like pretty solid group of movies a bunch of winners are deserved did you watch uh the best picture reveal with uh i did <laughs> my i see oppenheimer well, m- <laughs> my i see oppenheimer <laughs> and like just nobody knew if he was doing a bit i love that yeah not until the music kicks in yeah like, oh, i i guess oh, that's oh, yeah. it okay <laughs> i guess that's oppenheimer okay <laughs> i love that really phrasing <laughs> like that's been really like locked into my like brain like 
My, uh, every I time I see know. my internal monologue now is just yeah, my eyes see yeah. my cup of coffee, my eyes see <laughs> the steering wheel. They should they should <laughs> only allow best picture to be read by somebody that's under the age of eighty from now on because we've had too many problems here. No, <laughs> I had, like it. I think it should be only eighty year olds. <laughs> Maybe they're trying <laughs> to recreate crazy. the magic of the the. <laughs> the the year that moonlight won the year that emma stone won best picture for one second oh that was trying awesome. to create another controversy they know that they get clicks and viewers maybe i don't know <laughs> they should they should have like a like a curtain where like we know will smith is behind it and if something like if somebody says something <laughs> crazy he'll They'll rush freedom, out yeah 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 like don't release the beast. Like a three strike system. Three strikes and then yeah. Will is let out and someone's gonna get a slap in. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh no, he's getting angry. Yeah, I say, I say choose even older actors and make the text oh. on the letter smaller. <laughs> and just uh, see what happens. <laughs> can somebody help? <laughs> well, cool. All right, let's uh get on to Moulin. Rouge. Right, yeah, let's... You recommended this. Why? I did, and I'm sorry. But why did I'm you do so it, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, well, because I, I don't know. that This is one of those movies where it's kind of been in the periphery. I remember having, like, friends around 2001 that, like, loved Moulin Rouge. And, like, they're always, like... How old were they? Talking about it. Uh, they would have been, what, seven or eight, probably. Yeah. What? <laughs> Well, yeah. <laughs> no, so, wait, no, I'm just try I'm trying I'm trying to just get into the mindset here. So your <laughs> friends that were seven or eight years old yeah, loved yeah. this movie. And so you They love Moulin you were Rouge. Curious. It was in the periphery. You're like, I gotta figure out why these eight year olds love <laughs> this movie. Well it's more like as the decades go by, there has been like a Baz Luhrmann film kind of again in the periphery being talked about. I remember when the Great Gatsby came out. Again, like friends seeing it, talking about it, being in the zeitgeist, having conversations around it. Leo's in there. Yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. Um, and each one of these movies seems to have just like, I've, I've dodged it. The latest being Elvis. I think even an, an episode or two ago, I, I proudly said, I'm never going to see Elvis. Like that's, my, that's one I just want to never see. Um, but I thought, you know what? Moulin Rouge, that's supposed to be the good one. Out of Baz Luhrmann's filmography, that's like the one where this idea, these ideas of juxtaposing some, some, something old with something new, like the only other Baz Luhrmann film I've seen, the Romeo and Juliet he did in the 90s, again with Leo, with the gimmick being, hey, it's a contemporary setting and the Romeo's got a gun, mm -hmm. uh, but they're speaking Shakespearean English. Isn't that a fun juxtaposition and isn't that doing something? And here, Moulin Rouge is kind of the inverse of that, where you have the 1890s French setting, as I'm sure you guessed by the name, juxtaposed against this, was well, a musical, and there's, I don't know, they're singing like, like a virgin, um, remix pop things. Like the whole soundtrack is like, I, I wrote down the term for it, it was a term I'd never heard before. Um, to describe, I guess, this style of musical. Um, oh, hold on, I've just lost the <laughs> fucking term. <laughs> Jukebox musical. Yes. By which it means, like, what it implies, the jukebox is just a bunch of really existing popular songs kind of squished together, remixed, redone, put a bit of vibrato in there, even if it doesn't belong. And let's just put together the, the worst soundtrack you've ever heard. Um, I was yeah. really not anticipating that part of it because to me, I've never done much research on this movie, read much about it. I see the setting. I see the 1890s Paris. I see the poster with the big, the big windmill and all this kind of imagery. I think, oh, this is, I don't know much about musicals. I thought perhaps this was a musical that existed and had some kind of established storyline or a bunch of songs that people know already. So like one of the major dings really fast was when that music starts playing. It's like, wait, these, that was just like a bit of David Bowie. What, why, are they, why are they singing Heroes for a few minutes? What? And then like, it's all this like clash together uh, music, 
like from the 2000s it sounds like all like MTV like hits that now is weirdly kind of like <laughs> aged the film and cemented it in a time frame even more um i just got where where to even begin with this movie because like there there's there, there's some things i like about it but it like it undercuts itself and it trips over itself again and again and again and by the end like you just you really don't have nothing much left to play with or uh to be entertained by um i was yeah this is not what i was anticipating this is really not what i hoped or wanted it to be and what was, what did you what did you think was best case scenario i thought best case scenario this was like going to be a fun campy over the top kind of like ode to you know the vaudeville 1890 like aesthetic uh but injecting this like modern lens onto it like man i i just couldn't get into that aesthetic or style i guess you would call yeah. it it's like this ultra over the top campy maximalist style which you know what part of it part of the production i quite appreciate i quite like as far as the costumes some of the set design even some of the over the top like lighting and energy i appreciate the energy but the way it is strung together the way it's presented it it's like it it doesn't want to give you a chance to even engage it's like such an audiovisual bombardment like from from the word go you don't like get a chance to sit or uh experience the atmosphere or take in what it's even trying to show you because it is this like frantic you think like oppenheim has got that music video editing this it's, it's like that times 10 like every single scene feels like a not just a music video but a music video on like times two speed on youtube oh it's like headache yeah inducing. it's what it like if if you watch it on two times speed you might develop epilepsy <laughs> it, it genuinely kind of is that level yeah and like at the heart of it like each one of these things could, could be something interesting to me right like at the heart of it, you have this love story, super crazy saccharine love story between Ewan McGregor and Nicole Kidman, who are doing their best, I guess, um, with this corny, very like two dimensional, plain love angle where, like, I, th I noted down, I think they say some form of the word love like 140 something times. Um, yeah. And that's like the the core of the story, and it's like, well, I'm not really connecting with that. So, well, at least it's a musical, right? The what the fun musical numbers? Is there like a fun like level of theater to all this? And again, like every single thing has a caveat with it. Like, yeah, it does have the big flamboyant musical numbers and craziness, but you can't enjoy them. You you genuinely can't. The presentation of style destroys itself it like eats itself alive it's like something that if it were released today we would be accusing it of trying to capture the tiktok audience <laughs> like we would be accusing it of like trying to capture adhd babies <laughs> attention <laughs> well, yeah which is crazy to say and I, I guess i didn't expect you know like how with elvis for example um a big part of that is this same kind of gimmick, the whole like ju juxtaposing, oh, it's it's Elvis, but like we have Doja Cat doing part of the music and com remixing something old and making it new. And it's like, oh, so that's just kind of been this director's gimmick, I guess, the whole time. Cause it's like to taking Nirvana lyrics and putting them in this <sighs> film yeah, that, is that like the same thing in my mind. Where that it's was like, a weird well, one. Like, it's the turn of the century, like Nirvana's everywhere. We have to include that in the movie, right? And they're, they're trying to do this thing where it's like, yeah, we, we're recontextualizing pop lyrics by juxtaposing it on, yeah, this 1980s Paris aesthetic and like, yeah, the, the songs have different meanings now. Well, but 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 look at look at this like crazy aesthetic we've created by putting these things against each other. And it's like it's very uninteresting. It's, yeah, that's ultimately, I guess, my point. It's like, well, what, what is it actually 
what is that actually in service? Like, what does that create? You know, like juxtaposition can be a fantastic way of creating a uncomfortable mood or atmosphere or something intentional. You know, like a, a classic one, the the ear scene from Reservoir Dogs with the with the song playing. You know, the juxtaposition is that it's a kind of cheery, atmospheric song that doesn't really match the violent imagery you're seeing, which kind of makes it more disturbing and freaky. Then, like here, like what does what it actually embody the film with? Outside of like just making it more like toe tappery in terms of like oh I know that song I I yeah, already like yeah. this song because I I already like this movie because I like this song like type thing <laughs> you know? I was I was also thinking about Quentin Tarantino earlier today when remembering the fact that I watched Moulin Rouge mm. and and what separates Quentin Tarantino because he he makes like playlist movies they're not musicals but yeah. he makes movies where he likes a lot of songs he'll hear it like fucking the uh, whatever song you put in the Kill Bill with the five, six, seven, eights is what they were called. He was like, oh, yeah, I heard it like in a mall in Japan. And I asked him, like, what's this band? Oh, and right, I like, yeah, figured yeah, out yeah. how to put them in the film. He literally put the band in the film even. When he does that, and he does that in like pretty much every one of his films, you can tell that there's a vision there. You can tell that he was inspired by the song and used the song in a way where he was thinking of the best possible setting for the song to appear in like the juxtaposition of that ear scene in reservoir dogs is you know that's a great usage of the song he understands the tone of the song he understands how it would work in the context of what he's showing there's other mm -hmm. films like i don't know what you think about happy feet i love that movie i really do i need to revisit yeah yeah that that's that's an actual jukebox musical where they're taking other pre-existing tracks, but you can tell that there's a different context towards how they're used in each scene, and each song kind of helps the story to flow, and it moves along in some sort of progression. There's a, you know, it's slightly different setting for each song, or like a different context of like which characters are involved and how they're involved. In this fucking movie, it's the same throughout the entire fucking movie. It's just the mm -hmm. same shit. It's just a bunch of fucking weirdos dancing. <laughs> and it's like some of them are about love i don't know why the nirvana song was in there because that one that was just really unfitting like that, that didn't make any sense including that in the film i felt that way about most of the song choices like it, it just it just seemed like a 2001 playlist like a lot of these songs yeah would yeah be on there but there's no vision no no i don't get why there's no vision there and it, you can't you could interchange the songs at any other point that they're shown in the film and it would work just as well because it's just one repetitive amorphous blob of just like we're all partying for two hours and some of these characters are in love and that's what it's about it's love love the thing that you would use to sell movies to people that, that don't. yeah that's the only thing they got yeah it's, you're not really engaging with anything <laughs> it's just a really it's just a word Love. We we all like love. We all love love. They're in we love. Love love. Love's yeah, cool. Just, Am I right? Dog. That's relatable. It's it's like trying to do this. It's trying to like fuse high and low culture, and like really failing at it. <laughs> yeah. It just it just feels kitschy to me. Like, I d I know you've seen a bunch of his other movies. Have you seen the Romeo and Juliet I mentioned no. from the nineties? I, I am I am I I am not willingly watching another Baz Luhrmann film for the rest of my life. <laughs> fair, fair. But it had a similar problem. I haven't seen it in a long time, of course, but from my what my memory serves, the, that whole juxtaposition angle, again, I feel like, what what is that actually enhancing? Like, what is that? How is that really improving the story just by having that in place? You know, like the contemporary setting with the guns, and the dialogue, like, what, what is that adding? I don't know, it's cool or something. It's, it's like, a, it just seems like a, yeah, it's almost like gimmick filmmaking. It seems like very gim gimmicky filmmaking to me. Uh, and it's, it's weird because it does feel like such a, a waste because a lot of it, yeah, does feel like all of this work has gone in just to be wasted with this presentational style that doesn't, it, it like doesn't justify like what you're doing. Because, like, yeah, you have you have these actors, you have Ewan McGregor, you got got Jim Broadbrents, you got, I guess you got John Leguizamo in there as well, mm -hmm. I guess we can get into, but he's there. Um, you got these capable actors, but, like, that, 
it's not interested in the character it's not interested in even traditional like fun musical beats you'd expect there's kind of a an i want song in there that nicole kidman whips out which is one of the more solid parts to me um was her like on the rooftops and all of a sudden like the production like calmed down it wasn't cutting some like it cuts like sometimes multiple times a, a second in this film. yeah so to have a scene where it was like oh my god it's like i get like three or four seconds before a cut and it's like the mood is different it's like oh this feels like oh we're reeling back for a second i can take a breath and actually look at what you're showing me but even I, then, yeah, I feel like I was denied taking a breath for most of the yeah, film. Yeah. Like even even, even then, when the music like slows down and there's supposed to be some sort of dramatic moment of like oh something serious happened and it's still going like cut 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 yeah cut, yeah cut. But even cut, within cut, that sequence, cut. it undercuts itself with the uh, yeah you McGregor you McGregor like uh, is watching her in secret and kind of sneaks up behind her and then starts singing with her and the second they start singing together that that whole scene's ruined and just becomes another like it just feels like a string of references it's almost like ready player one style except for the songs instead of the random references to a visual idea mm-hmm. you know? it's just like remember this song and now beck is singing thing yeah it's like what, they like why? introduce them and like as if you're supposed to fucking clap They're like oh they start saying like a virgin i'm like are you gonna play the song They're like yep you could tell they were very proud of that scene. Like the, like the film feels like it's presenting as if it's being clever with that. Especially with that one, they felt like very proud of. The- they, just, they didn't fucking tie into anything other than the fact that like she said she was going to see a priest. They're like, oh, she'll be absolved of her sins like a virgin. Yeah, there's nothing really that justifies these tracks. Not at all. Um, especially with how. I don't know, there are a lot of them too. Maybe if there were... A billion. If there were like seven uses of like songs, that you pre-established songs that each time was like a really well-intended reframing of something to do with the pop song and the lyrics. And there's, there seemed to be like some kind of real intent or purpose to what they were doing. There may be. But they're, they're like... God, the director, he had to spend something like two years just getting legal permission to even use the small sections of all these 200-odd songs or whatever it is. And it's just like, why? That seems like the only part you're actually passionate about in terms of like a story or a, an aesthetic. Like that That's the important part. Like everything else around it is just like, that's the only thing it's in service of. Yeah, it's like it's, just, that's <laughs> the entire extent of the vision is just the aesthetic of just the the them being in that place and people wearing silly costumes and everything cutting really quickly and then just all of the songs existing. And that's the extent of the entire vision and it's the exact same throughout <laughs> the entire fucking movie. Roger Ebert liked this film. He gave it three and a half stars, but what he said in his review is one of those like, oh, you're just describing every reason why I didn't like it. So he <laughs> he commented on uh, saying that uh, you don't have to start from the beginning. You can just jump in at any point and you know exactly who loves who and who's the bad guy and everything. He said that the cuts feel like the film was fed through a fan blade. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, I think the the reasons why I don't like it is basically why he liked it, I guess. That's an awesome way of put that fan blade comment. That's like yeah. a great way of uh, summarizing the editing of the movie because it, it it really it, was Elvis that bad? Was was The Great Gatsby that bad? Like I didn't watch The Great Gatsby. Elvis was very bad. Like the editing was that level of like multiple cuts within a second yeah I, I was doing the exact same thing watching that movie i was just like i couldn't absorb anything about like the sets it wouldn't give me a fucking chance to because it's cut yeah. to the next fucking shot i'm like having a f- fucking aneurysm <laughs> watching the movie <laughs> well, c- yeah it's pain it's pain it is pain and i'm i guess i'm just extra surprised because from what i could pick up from the sidelines baz Luhrmann directed a film australia i think also with nicole kidman which is which is known as the oh that's that's the Baz you don't want to watch that's where it went a little bit wrong like Moulin Rouge is the apology for Australia or whatever type thing you you see people say and it's like what well if Moulin Rouge is the 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 good Baz I I don't want to know what bad Baz is like you can keep bad Baz away from me because 
Bad bass. <laughs> Because <laughs> th- this is another one of those examples where I feel like I look at the the rating and I read some of the reviews and I'm just like, I, 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 <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't know what you're talking about. Cause this is, <laughs> I know, and I know this is a, this is quite a like marmite movie, and it does have a bit of a reputation for that. And Baz Luhrmann does have that going for him, I suppose. But man, it it really is. It's like pretty much unwatchable at points. Um, especially mm-hmm. with the runtime too. Like I don't know. I, I'm 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 not against like some of the ideas. That's that's part of what's so frustrating is you can you can almost see like buried layers in that there is like the potential for like a fun ninety minute musical that kind of knows what it is and is more breezy and vaudevillian in a way that's actually kind of like fun or had like a bit of build up or like jokes that worked or like a location that was fun to exist like in. Like original songs or something, you know? That would be, yeah, that would be nice, wouldn't it? Like a... Just get, get a good composer, good team or something, good lyricist. Yeah, that alone would have been a huge, an enormous improvement to have a, a di- a just a different take with the, with the music entirely in that whole... Because it, un- it does undercut everything because that's what they're singing about. Like they are, it is, most of it is... Like our references to pop songs that exist, so they're like limited. that everybody knows that everyone already knows. So like you're limited with what you can express with that anyway, unless you're like really trying to get clever with like new meanings of lyrics and like reframings of things, which I I think is attempting at points, but I don't think it's really achieving. Or I don't think it's really pulling off anything particularly powerful with that as a statement or anything. Mm-hmm. Um, I. Was, uh, when reading about it, I thought it was interesting that a huge inspiration was Bollywood. Um, <laughs> cool. And you can see a few of those nods in the film. And it's like, uh, I guess, yeah, that that does. I can see that inspiration as far as like <laughs> some of these things that we we are clearly looking for. We're not we're not getting. And uh, I don't know. But there's I don't know. I was the RRR defender. Like I'm there for silliness. I love goofiness. I, I don't need the tone to be serious necessarily. That's not the problem. But I just need it to be not this. <laughs> I, like I I don't want a musical. I just don't like the concept of this type of musical. I think it's like it kind of defeats the whole point of what makes musicals interesting or cool to me. Yeah. To begin with, and it doesn't feel like uh it's celebrating the 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 eighteen nineties setting it's not not really no it doesn't seem particularly french outside of the title no i i <laughs> some of these choices like just undercutting itself again and again i gotta keep reiterating because like i mentioned john leguizamo and his character in this like please help me explain he's like he, he's already <laughs> so the, the, what what were they doing with him they did all these like special effects to make him like a tiny guy, I guess. Uh, f- for some reason, like why? Why did they do that? <laughs> I don't know. So they could have him dangling from the fucking window upside down, and so they could carry him. He could swing back and forth and go like, "Oh, they're so in love!" And like, blah, blah, blah. and every time that that character like screamed every line, there was yeah, there was a point where in my notes it was like two or three, yeah, two or three votes notes in a row that would just end with like John then screams or like screams his line the greatest thing is to love and to be loved in return I only speak the truth oh my god it's just like just give me a second I can't breathe this film does not let you breathe and it's like I don't, good time doesn't let you breathe but that all feels like intentional and like mm-hmm. there's an atmosphere and something building up and it's like it's not that it's not that it's like too much. It's just stylistically just kills the movie. I've, I've, I don't know if I've seen it quite this. The self sabotage be this intense just from like a pure stylistic level where I feel like even if you had the uncut shots, you could edit something better as long as there was like more real estate to work with. Like you could put something more enjoyable than whatever they chose to do with the kind of montage action editing they they went with here because it's 
it's unsufferable to sit through and it and it makes it, it it makes the whole movie just feel like one long scene like nothing yeah is distinguished like you never really you can't pick things apart it just feels like yeah this one overbearing aesthetic just drowning the whole film yeah the the whole point is interpretable from the first five ten minutes <laughs> and then nothing changes and then it ends eventually yeah and I, I think it's interesting even like just looking at it through the lens now of like it was what nominated for like eight Oscars a bunch of Oscars yeah eight, yeah I think it was seven or eight Oscars but interestingly look at look at the awards it was up for not many of them to do a writing no <laughs> basically not a single one to do with that script or the writing because it is all about the theatrics and production design and that's like the only thing that really got rewarded and that's the only thing I really would say I kind of liked about the movie and even then like the intent of it and the way it's used it's like so it doesn't create a world I want to live in even with like some of that goofiness like you know there's the scene where they throw the they throw something out the window and the scales all off and it like bounces into the Eiffel Tower and it's all like very cartoony and goofy and that's all very in intentional. There's like heaps of cartoony sound effects and over the top visuals and jaw harps and it's like really goofy and over the top. And again, to reiterate, I don't have an inherent problem with that, but it's just, it, it just, none of it feels like it's in service of anything. Like it's not, no. It's not building a world. It's not building an atmosphere. It's not telling a story outside of this really bland love thing. And even then, they don't even have fun with the antagonist character, this Duke character um, that's at the heart of this kind of like love triangle. He's He was one of the few performances I was kind of like, oh, there's something there. He's like trying. You can't really see it because it's like <laughs> being chopped up like a fan blade. So you don't, you're not really... But you're seeing little hints of it like, oh, this guy... He's got something behind this character. There's something he wants to say with it, but that character doesn't doesn't really get much to do. There's not like a fun uh, villainous song he gets to perform or any or any of this, any of the kind of theatrics I want to see from a big goofy musical. I just feel like I don't get any of it. Uh, yeah, all the creative choices, all of it, like including the the play within a play kind of like trope and just going nowhere with it it just kind of makes the characters seem dumber like them improvising this this poet improvising the story right in front of the duke and the duke the duke can't see any of the parallels it's like i'm fine with cartoony i love over the top i love i love that kind of thing but this packaging poison it, it it's it's very boring and very exhausting yeah cuz I, I was for the first I don't know, 45 minutes or so, I was kind of mindlessly entertained by just like, this is crazy. Like, hmm. <laughs> the fact that not only they thought this was, a, this was a good idea, but like they, they, <laughs> they followed through and committed to this awful stylistic vision. But the problem is that exhausting, overstimulating nature does become an exhaustive, <laughs> like difficult to sit through, uh, challenge of endurance by yeah. like the hour mark um when yeah you're just not like invested in anything that's going on you're, you're not you're not waiting for the next musical number you're not waiting for the next big st set they built or the next set piece it is just yeah plodding and feels pointless there's like no sense of flow no or like yeah it's not, it doesn't feel like it's building to anything like you get the towards the end where it is presenting the scale of the musical numbers as if this has all been building to this moment or this this setting this kind of conflict and yeah it, it's it's saying it all through the production but it's saying it in every way except the story <laughs> like it, you, you don't feel any of the, emo the emotion behind it or yeah it, it just feels so misled or misguided um in a, in a unique way to me, like a, this kind of bad was like at least kind of interesting, not being the biggest uh, Baz enjoyer. No. Kind of expecting something quite different um, <laughs> than, than what I wound up getting. To me, this movie is like indistinguishable from something 
that we would be talking about that ruined the careers of everybody that participated. <laughs> in it. You know, th- this is just a movie that happened to be a success, but I just, I don't like it's yeah, easily why? could have just been like the biggest fucking flop to, in terms of what the movie is. Like, I don't get it. Yeah. Especially when, like when Kylie Minogue appears as like that green fairy, um, and being voiced by Ozzy Osbourne, it's like, Oh my God, this is like movie 43. <laughs> level type shit right here like the the bad green screen the yeah i've, I've been praising some of that the, the real sets and the costume design and whatnot but every, there's a lot of like bad visual effect work and uh just poorly kind of thought out i guess blocking or storyboarding but like the it's, it's just obnoxious honestly like the the maximalist style of the camera is always moving it's like in visual effects shots it's flying through the streets of Paris in ways that just like, I don't know, it's not selling an aesthetic. It's just like key jangling. It feels like, <laughs> like, I, yeah, I just, every decision just feels like, oh my God, that thing has a caveat. That thing has a caveat. Maybe there was a good idea there. Ewan McGregor's trying, blah, blah, blah. It was, but none of it comes together. It all just, uh, yeah, it's all overshadowed. It suffocates itself and all clashes. I can't stand quick cuts. It just, it pisses me no. off. I can't stand it. No, it, it, yeah, it nearly always hurts. Like some of the more <laughs> notable recent memories, be it Bohemian Rhapsody or uh, Promising Young Woman. I remember having some really bad quick cut edit scenes. It really does hurt everything. <laughs> in a way that's I don't know it's not it's not that common to see it like that in a, in a way where it's like what you're supposed to be like a bunch of professionals auteurs over here like this stylistic choice is is hurting the 50 million dollars you've invested into this <laughs> this whole enormous project well it paid off I guess I don't know if I and yeah I guess like in the end it didn't matter <laughs> it it really paid off yeah because I guess this is the Baz playbook like <laughs> like he's still doing this kind of same shtick to this day like i didn't realize it was such a like dependable formula it's so weird that he did that with the elvis movie it's so weird that he did the same thing because <laughs> like in, in that sense you have to expect that some you know you're making a biopic essentially mm-hmm. and there's like a level of expectation that comes with that of people maybe i don't know liking the music of the musician that you're including yeah. in the film Maybe they don't want to hear Doja Cat. <laughs> Do you get it? Baz? Mm. Buzz? But that's the thing, though. So I think they do want to hear Doja Cat. I think he's found the formula, you know? Like, I'm just looking at, what, $85 million dollar budget for Elvis, gross worldwide, $288 million. Like, People saw that because it's an Elvis biopic, though. But it's the same with this, though, right? Like Moulin Rouge, like that's not based on a big pop star we know. I think people saw it. Well, I don't know. There, remember, I don't know how uh, conscious you were at the time. That cover of the Voulez-vous coucher avec moi? I uh-huh. think it was like Christina Aguilera. That was like a hit. That was a tie into the film and that was a hit. So they probably made a lot of money off of that. And that probably did a huge promo for the film because that was a huge hit that was on on the radio yeah and like pink was in it as well right like yeah 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 so i think that that did a lot of marketing lifting especially for this film i don't know you know there's a lot of people that connect with it so mm-hmm. i'm not yeah, those people love it not invalidating their experience just keep this cancer away from me i ne- <laughs> i never want to watch a Baz Luhrmann film ever again yeah it was it was tough not quite as expecting, but uh, I'm not. I'm not going to be jumping into the other Baz movies with uh, any urgency. That's for sure. No. Um, yeah, just a just a weird film. Another one for the pile of the. Uh, I guess I, I'm the odd one out here. <laughs> I, I don't know what I'm supposed to take away from this or be inspired by with this because like. Is it just like an Australian director quirk? Because <laughs> what, like George Miller, he, he does like similar things in like the Mad Max movies and his genie movie and whatnot, You're using this sped up photography and like crazy maximalist stylings. But like when you just mentioned Happy Feet as well, but there there is intent to this more over the top 
these choices purpose um the, yeah the purpose of it and this it can work and it's not just the craziness on its own that i have an issue with it's just none of it yeah feels in purpose in service of anything or like it's building to something or yeah that that main dynamic which is just not interesting the nicole kidman character was not very interesting the manic pace dialogue like embarrassing like it's not good dialogue <laughs> no like the stuff they're saying um yeah the weird clash of like the nirvana cover that was supposed to be like marilyn manson but then courtney love was beefing with marilyn manson oh, so that's they had funny. To recover it and change it and then get, yeah all these different permissions beck doing david bowie christina aguilera fat boy slim it's like you've just <laughs> you've almost unintentionally created this uh this time capsule of all the all the worst stuff from 2001 that I just like never want to I, I don't yeah. want to exist in this little pocket that has been created by this movie it's like oh this is all the reminders of the stuff I don't want to see and like uh <laughs> it's like if you threw a jukebox through a fucking blender yeah or like I've, uh, not to bring up the fucking AI topic again but on on Spotify like now they've got this built in like hey it's your AI DJ guy yeah um and i tried it out the other day and it was like oh my god like if you think the radio can be bad this thing, <laughs> this thing sucked and it's like yeah it's like that level um <laughs> like i just don't want to engage with any of this this is this is clashing this is not why i watch movies in fact it's, it's the complete inverse of what i like about especially musicals and that whole that whole you know backbone of theater and I love that, but not here. I'm sorry, Baz. This was like a one and a half star um, to me. Very difficult to sit through. I get people like it. I, I guess I like the cast on paper. They're trying their best. Ewan McGregor. He's got. He's got a crying scene. He's got. I know we know we know he's capable. He's got range. So does Nicole Kidman. But yes, yeah, not not here. Not these characters. Not this story quite an insufferable unlikable film uh yeah one out of ten fuck buzz lerman down with buzz lerman up with buzz punperia okay <laughs> we got a better buzz who directs movies he made a movie called one for, for the road that was great uh bad genius we covered on the podcast so watch some buzz punperia movies mm. instead one out of ten fuck buzz lerman never watching any of your films again unless you <laughs> decide to recommend one for me on the podcast at some point <laughs> or or unless it's got so many oscar nominations that i feel like kind of unless it's got a, like a best picture nomination <laughs> then i have to fucking watch another one Ugh. yeah don't speak too soon <laughs> they just keep handing them best picture nominations yeah yeah i don't know they love them so that's a yeah no no more baz facade i'm afraid Th is that a promise I think so. Yeah, like I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm, I'd, I'd be happy never seeing another Baz film till the, till the day I die. <laughs> what one of my notes was? Did I do something mean to Alex? <laughs> I, was, I was like, what? Why is this happening? <laughs> yeah, no, that that's uh, one of the few things that made it possible to sit through. Oh, it's just um, imagining it was, it was my just, pain. just picturing you like, oh, oh. Yeah, you're going to be enjoying. Uh, no, no. <laughs> John Leguizamo screaming. It's how I make a living. <laughs> being upset. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody loves it. <laughs> All right, question time. See some questions then from the Sardonicast community. Head over to the suggestion thread over on the subreddit. We can ask questions for future episodes just like Eddie245 did what are your thoughts on journeyman filmmakers i dislike this term because it seems to diminish the work of filmmakers such as james mangold or christopher mcquarrie who have made great films so this was a this was a term i wasn't really familiar with but in reading about it was like oh no i've i've had kind of my interpretation of what they're getting at with this but i guess i'd tended to refer to them more as like uh opportunists or director for hires or uh i don't know there's a, there's a bunch of like directors that sit in this pocket um not not really james mangold or christopher mcquarrie that 
come to my mind as far as that that brutal uh, description of a opportunist or a director for hire. But I really do feel like people like um, Peyton Reed or David Yates, mm. these these people where it's like you got a big big Hollywood production. We need someone who's not going to push the envelope, who's going to deliver, hopefully even uh, ahead of time, ahead of schedule, keep the budget slow. And they're just, I mean, Peyton Reed's the perfect one because he, he literally directed that film, Yes Man. Um, <laughs> yeah, true. He's, all, he's all, yeah. <laughs> always the one that pops to my head as far as the journeyman filmmaker is concerned. Um, oh, there's so, but John Favreau is actually another good one. Mm-hmm. Um these people who it's kind of the inverse of an auteur, you know, someone like as much as we just were going on about Baz and his, his stylings, it's, it's not, it's not for a lack of character or lack of uh, artistic expression where the problems kind of come from him. Whereas yeah, a Peyton Reed or a John Favreau, what, what is their yeah. director calling card? What is their, <laughs> what is their kind of stylistic? Exactly. Uh, voice that they bring you know brett ratner's your um, mm-hmm. i uh, i prefer to watch films from directors where i'm able to tell that it's them even if i didn't yeah. know beforehand mm-hmm. my favorite directors yeah. are ones where like even if i didn't know they directed it i could watch a movie and be like oh this is their voice and see how they made something and connect with it in that way because then then you know part of the Art for me is being able to look at something and ask myself questions about why something is filmed or presented in a certain way. Mm -hmm. So even though, sure, Buzz Lerman (laughs) Mm -hmm. is one of those, doesn't connect with me at all. The types of artists that I generally gravitate towards are uh, ones that have a style and a voice and a vision. Is there a one of these filmmakers that does like pop into your head when you think of that assembly line kind of yeah Peyton Reed Grey Goop kind of director yeah I mean I, I think I've described James Mangold this way before is mm-hmm. I'm like I'm not like rushing to see a movie because he directed it because we don't really know what the fuck it's going to be like yeah and he's yeah he's he's got that whole like uh dad movie thing going mm-hmm. on james mangold um yeah i, th- I think that's fair uh i kind of i like james mangold probably more than a Peyton reed or a david yates or one of these um but I, yeah i do agree mm-hmm. there's, there's, yeah there's not a big strong so what's the list of like uh yeah call the james mangold calling cards um <laughs> Or like references in his filmmaking. Uh, yeah, not not much. And there are, I don't know, there, there are countless. There are probably more of these types of figures than there aren't. There are probably more of these than auteurs. So if you <laughs> click them and, and count them up, you just don't really know who they are, you know? Yeah, like, just industry people. Yeah, people who work well within the confines. They're good at navigating through it. They get their shit done. They don't press too hard. <laughs> yeah, nothing nothing wrong with that because, you know, there's a certain type of people... Uh, sorry, there's a certain type of person that that's what directing is to them. is not mm-hmm. really expressing a part of your soul, but doing the job in a technical way. And if that's yeah. what they want to do, then there's no issue with that. And they're technically showing things in their film and they're technically capturing the information and the tone and whatever the film calls for in a certain way. If that's what they want to do, that's fine. I just don't, it's not something that I feel strongly enough about to seek out. Yeah. What's that classic balance of the, it's often boiled down into the the one for them, one for me type attitude of like, yeah, I'll do the artistic statement and then I'll do the thing that makes it so I'm, green lit for future projects mm-hmm. um so, so i can keep continuing in this space and I feel yeah. Like, yeah but i mean these guys are one for them one for them another for them <laughs> yeah that's the Forever thing for is them. It, yeah <laughs> like when it becomes a 
when you look at like I keep, I'm really just zoning in on Peyton Reed right now but when I yeah when I look at him I feel like the balance is like way off and it's like I don't see a Peyton Reed movie I feel that I see a an enormous paycheck from Disney Disney normally um with yeah. whatever is uh yeah coming from him um but yeah th- these are th- these people are everywhere like a random one just popped into my head like the, the fellow who directed like men in black international and like let's see who that is fast and furious eight he's called like i always name i always read his name as gary gary but it's like <laughs> gary gray or something um he he directed F like gay gay <laughs> <laughs> i think he did the straight out of compton movie uh huh. that italian job remake mm. uh yeah men in black international fast and furious eight like just those type of filmmakers sort of say law-abiding citizen yeah there you go that was a f- that was a funny movie there you go i don't know yeah there's Classic. countless of these kind of tiers of directors so. yeah why not let's do this one from james marsden 0472 what was the best movie that you were shown in school just asking because i watched three identical strangers in psychology class um, if, for the best one I remember being screened to my class was Threads, probably. Um, mm. A nice, uplifting nuke movie. Um, and that's, yeah, that's set in England, too, so that probably also explains why they showed it. Um, it was mostly, like, shit, though, that, like, as far as, like, films that they showed in school. It was like, oh, yeah, the last week before Christmas, well, let's put Cars 2 on, or whatever, you know. Like, yeah. Yeah, it's always some bullshit. It's always some bullshit. I think my e- English teacher in high school put on Hero, and I don't remember how I feel about that movie, so I have to rewatch it. Hero. But I remember enough about seeing some of the, like, wire foo stuff that that, like, st- it's good that I can remember shots from it. Like, right, that's a yeah, good yeah. thing. <laughs> yeah, I haven't seen this one. Yeah. It's just, it's just it's so, like, not the environment. Like, it's bad enough when you go to, like, <laughs> the cinema um, and you got to compete with the people that, like, are also paying to be there. But in, like, classroom environment, it's just, I don't know, it's not conductive to... <laughs> Yeah, you don't want to show something too controversial. Yeah, well, actually, speaking of Buzz Lerman, um, I'm pretty sure we wound up watching that fucking Romeo and Juliet oh. adaptation like three or four times in oh. English lit. Because like, I guess so many it's people struggle with the dialogue. Like I did as well. It's like, it must have been like year nine, year eight. Like, what are they, what are they saying? You struggle with the dialogue? What, you <laughs> want them to change the movie? <laughs> And just too stupid, okay? You want them to not have Shakespearean dialogue in a Shakespeare movie? <laughs> you want the you want them to cater to you? I'm too what dumb, the heck? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's, it's mostly a lot of bad what kind of comedic associations like my my same English lit teacher <laughs> The only thing I remember about her was she was obsessed with X-Men <laughs> or, Origins Wolverine. Nice. She had like the poster on <laughs> on the wall, and this was talking great. about <laughs> Hugh Jackman That's funny. In that movie. But it's like, whew. yeah, that's all my associations. Mm-hmm. Uh, let's do this one from Frosty Story eight eight seven. Hi Sods, I know you guys are a fan of Kill Bill Volume One and Two, and many Tarantino fans have been hoping that his tenth and final film would be. Kill Bill Volume 3. However, it's been revealed that his last <laughs> film will be called The Movie Critic. Are you upset as much as I am that Kill Bill 3 will never happen? Do you, or do you think it's a good thing to leave Kill Bill as a duology instead of a trilogy? Do you think Quentin Tarantino should break his 10 film rule or write the screenplay for someone else to direct it? Thank you. Sods. Well, I don't know. Would we be bringing back Uma Thurman and are they like cool with each other? Because like the during Volume 2, he like permanently injured her. And that's probably why. That's right. I'd forgotten about that. Like yeah. uh, with some of the stunt work, right? He was, yeah. Uh, he was like insisting asshole. she kept driving the car faster. And you could only see the back of her head. Like you easily could have had a stunt double. Like there's a there's a b- good lot of legitimate reasons for like them to b- have some not, 
you know, not wanting to work with each other again. So that might be the biggest reason why that's not happening. You know, there's room for some kind of a sequel, maybe with like uh, Vivica A. Fox's character's daughter or something. Yeah. Getting trying to get revenge. But it's like, then it's like, if you don't have Uma Thurman, then like, do we want that? I don't know. Like, I'm Kill Bill Volume 1 and 2 are incredible. I think that so much time has passed. Like, there, there's a lot of nostalgic member berries, and there's a lot of, like, trying to unearth the past or make a prequel or a requel or whatever. They don't usually capture the magic <laughs> when so much no. time has passed. No. So, I don't know. I, I'm not... I wasn't... I wasn't upset or surprised. I'm interested in whatever his last film is, and we'll see what it is. Yeah. I, d- I don't think it's, like, aching. It doesn't feel like, oh, man, we're never, we're never getting that, that, that story we're owed. So, I yeah. feel like part one and two are pretty pretty complete. Um, yeah, there's little threads you, can, you could pull out here and there or expand on, but, yeah. Well, why even risk it at that point? We've got the good thing. Why not just, when Kill Bill ends... When part two ends, just start part one again. Like <laughs> we've got that, it's good. I, I don't get why he has to limit his stuff to ten films. I, I kind of don't believe him. I feel like <laughs> when he finishes, he might just I don't know, just go into a different style of production or a different avenue. You know, books, uh, TV. Uh, I'm sure we'll come back to film one day. Like why? Why? He stop? can call a Miyazaki. He can pretend yeah. retire a couple times. I guess. I guess he's. I've heard him in like interviews and whatnot before. He's like scared of the concept of being one of the directors that can't maintain the string of quality, which I understand to a certain degree. But it's also like, I mean, you have you haven't really had a miss as far as like commercial and critical to the degree where it's going to even remotely hurt your career or your standing as a director. So. <laughs> or your legacy or whatever. Or legacy, like, yeah. Yeah, I mean, do whatever makes you happy. If, you know, you got to be making movies, then keep making movies. Yeah. If you want to sip margaritas, then sip margaritas. <laughs> and a, a part of it does feel like a, like a marketing type thing. Like, Jonathan Glazer could make it part of his thing where it's like... Uh, t- 10 years I'll, I'll do my next thing and I, every 10 years is going to be one and it's going to be huge I don't know yeah yeah just bigging yourself up in marketing yeah, we'll and all this hmm, I'm curious on this one from uh, Gordon Morgans is there a running joke you guys created on your channels that you're now sick of um <laughs> I put, I I really don't care. Like I still get like dumb emails to this day. Like, if you hate everything, does that mean you hate yourself? Um, mm. But like I, I don't really care. I mean, <laughs> that must kind of suck if you <laughs> if it really bothered you every time like reference someone reference Cool Cat or <laughs> something like if that really got you down or annoyed you. That would be kind of a bummer. Um, hmm. Well, yeah, sometimes there's there's some there's none that I'm like, oh yeah, get this out of here or whatever. Like and also <laughs> I'm the type of person where, you know, I can look at my past and not feel the need to denounce it. I can look at my past and not feel the need to you know, I, I can look at myself and just be like, Okay, wow, that's a person that I was and who cares? And we all grow. There's some that are kind of like inkling in that territory where I'm like, okay, we've, I don't know if we've moved past the heart of what the joke was. So like Mm. there was a, some of the commentary things, it's like, there was an earnest, I think it was Scoot where he was like, or was it Gael? I don't remember. It was one of those two. Mm. And they were like, it's the Asian guy from 13 reasons why. And we're like, it's not. And then it turned out not to be. And then we kept referencing that as a way to poke fun at the fact that he got that wrong. And so, yeah. <laughs> and so then it's just like, oh, an Asian person comes on screen. Hey, it's the Asian guy for 13 reasons why. The context of the joke is that we're making fun of the initial mistake, the initial yeah. misconception yeah, yeah. of what that was. But I'm like, I'm like looking at some, it's not like the biggest meme on the channel or, or whatever, but sometimes I look at, you know, someone will like post something like that. I'm like, 
do we really i don't know if we really want just like see an asian person and then say a thing sort of thing right like in the same way that you wouldn't want to go like hey it's jackie chan where it's like is it is it losing the spirit of what the original joke was which was making fun of a uh, like you know, perceived like, haha, that means you're racist, sort of thing. Mm. The 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 butt of the joke shouldn't be the the Asian person. The butt of the joke should continue to be the initial, you know, confusion of I f- even forget which one of them did it. Right. So in that sense, there's you know, I'm constantly thinking about things and being self critical. So there's something mm-hmm. there. So I just want to like make sure that it doesn't turn into something that it shouldn't, I guess. But so far, nothing, nothing has crossed that line. Yeah, I guess. Well, you can't be completely unaware of that, can you? Yeah, exactly. Because um, I don't know, like comedians, they they reassess old material, or uh, like uh, I remember, I think it was like a Dave Chappelle story where he was on about like he had this this material that was. So the gag was racist and he was noticing in certain crowds that like <laughs> certain, certain <laughs> subsects within the crowds were laughing a lot more than everyone else and it was like mm-hmm. becoming this pattern it was like well, maybe <laughs> maybe we should like kind of reassess some of this and uh, <laughs> see how this is being interpreted um, yeah it's something to yeah, at least yeah. be aware of and yeah see where it goes or see if any kind of community policing is necessary yeah like the as far as policing your community and the responsibility that comes with that because some some people on like youtube really don't think there's any responsibility like none and there's like a firm line and then i disagree with that i think that yeah i i think that there's a that people see things in such a weird binary way where Mm -hmm. I do agree that like, oh, just because someone from your community did something shitty or like, let's say you make a video and it's like, oh, somebody's harassing this person. Like that wasn't the intention, right? Mm -hmm. I do agree that to some extent, you know, you can't necessarily blame the content creator for things that are out of their control. But I think that following that same line, I think that the content creator should do whatever they possibly can to not give people ammuni- ammunition that want to make that claim. Mm-hmm. You know, like in my Kimba video, like I blurred out like a lot of the names of people, unless it was like a, an actual professor <laughs> who wrote a bit, unless you wrote a book that you published, like I was blurring people's names. Yeah. I'm like, okay, like it, there's no reason to like put this much heat on someone in this thing that people are going to get like really fired up about. Right. You know, and I usually, you know, on Twitter, don't clap back unless people are justifying death threats Mm -hmm. or justifying death threat like language or shit like that. So I think I there there, there's somewhere in between. There's a nuance to it. Like a lot of my opinions on things, it's not completely one way or the other. So I, I think that I think that policing your own community is important and you should try to curate your community into something that you're comfortable with and something that you you know like i i know that i have a good community and part of that is because i've banned a lot of (laughs) assholes right Mm -hmm. and so yeah there's certain things that you know you can't prevent either being brigaded or other people showing up trying to you know represent your community in a way that's not accurate but you can police it in a certain way where you can make it clear like hey i don't tolerate that kind of language i don't co- tolerate you know you saying this about like trans people or whatever like hey mm-hmm. here's your warning you're gonna go you know and i think that that does help build like a, a better community at least from what your standards are for yeah. what you would like to see in your community yeah it definitely I don't know, it's, it seems like a naive thing to say or think that you don't have some kind of effect on yeah an audience and what they are interpreting. Like why else? Like the, it's it's turn, the term is influencer at this point. Like if you had no influence on anybody, like why would that even be the t- you yeah? Know, like, and I, I mean, like even to the extent where you necessarily don't, it's not like you have the ability to like 
control everyone's minds in your audience but you have the ability to ban people (laughs) you have the ability to have them not show up like on your stream or at least have to create another account to do so this i'm I'm sure you realized at a certain point um because i did too uh just with the nature of video editing and putting it out there and the understated power of presentation and like just what you can sell mm-hmm. like ideas you can sell the, the stakes are low in the way like we're talking about like movies and uh, movie opinions and whatnot but when you kind of twig on that there is like a huge element to like just the way information is presented can make you sound like you know more about what you're talking about or mm-hmm. this or that and it's like s- there's so much going on with that um I don't know, it kind of opens this whole new world of, like, just thinking about, like, uh, as someone who makes video, the potential for propaganda, the potential for influence, and I don't know, there's, like, a lot of craziness in there, and it feels... I I, I often go back to this, like, Pandora's box concept of, like, yeah, there's a lot of craziness on YouTube, and a lot of crazy stuff, a lot of crazy opinions, a lot of crazy stuff being said but we ca- we have just kind of been handed pandora's box in an open state it's like where does the buck stop at a certain point like we've just allowed mm-hmm. we've we've opened it and we've allowed this to influence the culture and w- without really understanding it um <laughs> so yeah it's like a very complicated subject um and trying to treat it as if it is a black and white like easy thing to navigate or there really are rule. There are more rules now, but like, man, early social media was like a lawless, wild west type situation. Yeah, where like, it no was fun. One knew, like, <laughs> <laughs> it was definitely fun, but like, I was definitely like seeing shit and saying shit I definitely shouldn't have been engaging with or seeing. Like, mm-hmm. well, like the early two thousands. Like the man, it was just a different time, different, different landscape different landscape and just yeah seeing over the decades as well like the the way it has seeped out or saying earlier about how there is that disconnect between like the online and twitter and real life and whatnot but there is there is there is a change in people that has happened over the 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 more exposure to uh this stuff and information communication technology and all this stuff like I don't know. I kind of feel like we're just we're just beginning. <laughs> uh, in this I space. think we're and just getting started. This is, <laughs> yeah, you can sell the ticket for part two now. Solana cost part two. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. The the most often I see the response of like, you what you can't do anything about your community. Those are usually coming from people that have like comparatively toxic communities <laughs> yeah well they, they know they can't take responsibility <laughs> i think that they fucking for sure know that <laughs> and that's their <laughs> excuse that they tell themselves so that they don't have to appear like i don't know soy or something uh-huh. or whatever they're afraid of <laughs> like appearing as like oh i can't yeah, be yeah. i can't be lame i can't be uncool to to not allow constant n words <laughs> mm-hmm. and and constant and like knowing that like people in my community are like brigading other communities and blah, blah 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 i think i think that they know that they are tolerating that and actively choose not to do anything about it mm-hmm. because they know that that's you know it makes up like either a, a significant chunk of their audience or they're maybe worried about like appearing yeah. lame or something sometimes it is as simple as just maximizing audience capture and of course like well yeah if if you have a channel this may, it has a certain audience saying certain things and it's making loads of money what incentive do they have to stop saying the thing that's making them loads of money you know it's kind of as simple as that sometimes yeah yeah some people gravitate towards these communities because they know that that's tolerated and that's just the type of thing they like to do yeah, and speaking of gravitating towards communities, so should we do one more here from Sure, uh, one more. Cynic Doki two three nine. Do you guys have any advice on how to stop yourself from seeking validation from people online beyond having thicker skin? Or do you have any advice on how to grow thick skin in this context or not obsessively attach yourself to an IP? Um 
So this kind of, yeah, brings it all together, what we've been talking about almost the entire episode. Mm -hmm. um, people just kind of attaching themselves to movies, characters, uh, political movements. Um, how do you keep it in check as far as engaging online? Um, a lot of mine, my approach is to kind of just take a step back and yeah, remind myself a lot of this is just online discourse and you, it, it does begin and end there a lot of the time. And so much of it is just fake. Like I don't get much validation off the random people I see on Instagram or whatever, because it's like, it's not real to me. I know <laughs> I see the angles they're using, the ring lights they're hiding, the, mm -hmm. the face app, like blemishes they're covering. It's like, none of that bothers me. So yeah, I feel like I can just intellectualize my way out of it, like layer by layer. Um, but I, yeah, I, I I'm just speaking from a, a place of privilege it feels like because this wasn't an issue in my life till i was like 17 18 already so a big chunk of my development <laughs> that this would really impact was already kind of over so um yeah god god forbid if you're like 12 years old and you're trying to navigate this um i feel like that's kind of a different challenge and you probably need some kind of guidance well it depends it depends what you're seeking out and what like you value right so my experience growing up was one where I felt very like alone and like I wasn't able to mm -hmm. connect with the majority of people. And, you know, my opinions and my personality and the way I think and the way I communicate with people is kind of like neuro atypical, <laughs> you could mm. say. Like I approach conversations in a different way than you might expect the average person to or relationships, et cetera, et cetera. But my experience with that has also kind of formed the types of things that I value and want to put out to the world because it was never, you know, Bright Eyes doesn't make music to be heard by everyone. It makes music to be connected with by a small amount of people and that mm -hmm. connection is going to be so strong that it's going to be much more meaningful to them than if it was just something that literally everybody can connect with yeah and so what i'm selling on my channel and throughout the other things that i create my music is on authenticity and that's mm. what i strive to do and so if there's like a movie that i don't connect with and i know that like everybody's fucking loving it or whatever there there's a part of my brain that might put a bit more like preemptive criticism into what I'm putting out and I might like want to fact check something and I'll be like even if I saw it in theaters I'll like okay like maybe I should tortilla a cam rip or something just to like confirm whether or not this thing that I remember happening happened mm. in that sense I'll be a lot more careful with those sorts of things but I'm not gonna like lie about my experience and I'm not going to like pretend to enjoy something that I didn't or pretend to hate something that I enjoyed. And I think that the people that do connect with that sort of thing, like that's the reason why I have an audience and a core fan base. I don't know how much of my audience it makes up, uh, but it's definitely something that is, you know, people are expecting. So mm -hmm. yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I don't, even within my audience, you know, I'm, I'm, they know that they would rather, well, enough people know that they would rather have an honest perspective that they disagree with than a fake perspective that they agree with. And there's enough people in my audience that feel that way. And so that I, yeah, that's just how I live my life. Yeah. And I, f I feel like a lot of people struggle with, um, they get all their validation externally, all of it. Um, and like everything, if that balance is off, it can become a really negative force in your life. Like I've known people that like have thrown themselves away to s chasing sources of external validation. Um, yeah. In, in ways that, yeah, that doesn't make sense. People get so lost in comparison games or especially if we're talking uh, you know, social media, the validation you can get when it does turn into Instagram likes or YouTube subscribers or blah, 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 blah. it can get quite inhuman and like detached and, uh, yeah, kind of psycho. Um, mm -hmm. 
if that's your entire axiom or like world view is all about external validation, I, I feel like that only goes one way. Um, so I I call it being cucked by society. <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. Like, could you like the, seriously? Um, like we kind of touched on this of just the idea. Like a lot of people are really concerned about like whether or not they come off as like cool or something mm -hmm. like that, right? Like a lot of people, that's a huge concern to them. Do what makes you happy. And if it's not harming anybody else, if you're in a safe enough environment, I guess, then be open about it. Try to not hide things about yourself that that would ruin your life if the secret ever came out sort of thing. I take comfort in the fact <laughs> that like, there's there's nothing that people can really use against me that's not already just like out and open and a part of my character. Mm -hmm. Own your shit. Don't get society cucked. Yeah. Right? When I, you know who you are and you have an, a sense of self, whereas, you know, a lot of these people are desperately seeking external, down of a, external validation don't know themselves. So they've got no foundation. Um, so, of course, like... It's not even a, a a a question of building up like a, a thick skin, really. I don't think that's even the way to think about it. It's just more to know. It's more about more about knowing yourself. Like, mm -hmm. what is it about you that is encouraging this behavior? Looking for constant external validation. Maybe that's where the thought process should be going. Maybe you should be yeah. a little bit more internal. Maybe you should yeah think about it as far as yourself instead of yeah all these random people all over the world projecting out their, their perfect little slices perfectly curated for social media. Like, it's just meaningless. Like, Yeah, and, and also if you're like a self-critical enough person, hopefully not to the point of it being like detrimental, but, you know, people that keep themselves in check in some way can receive criticism and part of the you know it's a bit of a challenge sometimes but part of the experience of being a person on the internet and sharing your perspectives and being you know comments turned on and all that shit mm -hmm. is eventually trying to figure out like what is the valid criticism what is the invalid criticism right yeah because there are valid criticisms to every Absolutely. person and sometimes those criticisms can be helpful and you can agree with them and be like, you know what? Yeah, that's not a bad way to look at something or a bad uh, trajectory to uh, try and navigate towards. But yeah, I mean, as we mentioned earlier, this episode, <laughs> there's <laughs> you got to be able to distinguish that part. Part of being yeah. healthy about criticism is distinguishing that from people who literally it doesn't matter what you say and they just want to hate you. People mm -hmm. that are just being bad faith that are holding you to standards that they don't hold any other person to. Yeah, absolutely. Damn. All right. I think we did it. I guess it's time to recommend a movie. You got a rec? Yeah. What, what have you got? Well, so I, I spent a good chunk of the runtime of Moulin Rouge plotting my revenge. <laughs> and... <laughs> And so we're we're now we are now in Bring the it. the uh, Sardonicast arc of revenge based recommendations. <laughs> so it's really gonna get better now. Yeah, yeah. So we're, this is uh, we we can break the cycle at any point, but I have decided today it's too good of an opportunity to pass up. Mm -hmm. uh, hate begets hate, I know, but <laughs> <laughs> I. <laughs> <laughs> I, I had to watch a Baz Luhrmann film, so this is, this is what happens here. So I found uh, two movies that I think neither of us have watched. Mm -hmm. It's a double feature, and uh, <laughs> okay. the total runtime's under three hours. Don't worry, they're both under 90 minutes. Mm -hmm. They're both from 2013, from the same director, David DeCoteau. Mm -hmm. One of them's called... A Talking Pony? <laughs> <laughs> With... Uh, exclamation mark question mark and exclamation mark uh all there and uh i realized the same director had a film called a talking cat <laughs> from the same year from okay. the same year same director two different writers and uh oh. <laughs> i think so i post i gave you the imdb links in there and i figured i figured it was a good opportunity because we a 
We have a little bit more time before the next episode. We'll be back on mm. the regular schedule next time. Uh, although I guess one three hour movie could have been a wreck anyway. But <laughs> and also I was able to find both of them on YouTube in HD like oh, legit beautiful. copies. So <laughs> I don't know if you'll need a VPN or not, but I, I downloaded them so I can, I can give you a copy of them. OK, either way. awesome. So we're going to see what the fuck these things are. So the sa- the same director, same yes. year, same director, same year. He really <laughs> loves the um, exclamation mark question mark exclamation mark formula. There was another film that he released that I think that year. Oh, so it's Duffy the talking cat and a talking pony, right? Hmm. There's a two. There's two movies. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm just getting confused because uh, I I think I've seen a talking cat like. I've got oh, it rated it? on IMDb. <laughs> um, I th- yeah, I must have like a long, long. But you don't time remember ago. it. Um, I remember nothing. Okay, nothing. but you haven't seen a talking pony. I haven't seen the pony one. Okay, um, but I'm just seeing it on IMDb for the <laughs> the talking cat one. It's well, original title, a talking cat, but then it's got a new title, Duffy the talking what? cat. Is that what it says on IMDb? <laughs> on for IMDb, you? yeah, yeah. Because I was like, where's oh, the other? It doesn't say that for me. Oh, okay. Did you did you click the link that I gave you? Where'd you put it? There, I put it in the uh, in Zoom. There's uh, on the oh, bottom. Zoom. Click the chat because you might be on the wrong. There might be more than one movie called The Talking Cat. <laughs> oh, sorry, I accidentally posted the wrong link for the. Yeah, I can't one. see hold, it. Hold on, um, I can do it in. Uh, I'll just give you the Telegram. Y- here. Yeah, send it on Telegram. I'll, I'll hold on one second. It. Yeah, there's The Talking Cat. Hold on, opening it. And then here's The Talking Pony. And I don't know which one to watch first. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think they're related. Just, just release date, I reckon. Yeah. yeah. Well, they're both 2013, okay. but I mean, Talking Cat <laughs> came out first. <laughs> okay, these look yeah. pretty far. So that, that wasn't the other one that you have seen then? Was that a different Talking Cat movie? I think it's the same one. What? Like, I, look, I just sent a screenshot of like what I'm looking at. It's the same poster, same... <laughs> Oh, just Duffy the Talking Cat, maybe just for the UK. <laughs> Probably, maybe this is a Zootropolis situation. Mm. Um. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so the director also released a film called My Stepbrother is a Vampire? But I thought that that would be too much to include, even though that was the same year. And it was the, it was the same combination of exclamation mark question mark exclamation mark and i was like oh interesting little- you see how many director's credits they've got on yes IMDb. it's another uh <laughs> bioden steven situation which yeah yeah somebody pointed out on the subreddit here's a correction i think they're a woman yeah they had a blank imdb there to be fair they apparently found their photo on letterboxd yeah they had no description on imdb and no picture on imdb so we made some assumptions. Sorry for misgendering uh, Byatt and Steven. If we are to believe that that is actually their picture and that's who they are. <laughs> yeah. Because there was, wasn't much information we had to go off. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, and you remember nothing about this movie, but you have it rated. Nothing. I've got it rated there. Okay. This will this'll be fun. Yeah. Maybe something will be triggered, <laughs> but we'll see. <laughs> and remember, you promised never to recommend another Baz Luhrmann film. Okay. So <laughs> if you if you feel like you got to get revenge again, you got to get a bit more creative. Okay. Or you can break the cycle and be a good person. No, I've, I've already got my revenge plan. Oh, shit. Like, I've, I've, had, I've had one like just saved in oh, the background no. oh, for no. so long. But, this like, is just... the arc. Just this is the arc. We're going. Bring it out. Is, yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I am asking for it, so whatever. All right, if you don't want to be spoiled for a talking cat <laughs> and a talking pony directed by David DeCouteau, 2013 films, watch them before the next episode. The, these episodes come out every two weeks. You can listen to them early by going to sardonicast.com, signing up for premium, or patreon.com slash sardonicast two dollars a month will get you these episodes early you can support the show and uh yeah we got uh, merch in the description link in the description on the youtube we got a sardonicast highlights channel check that out subscribe it's on youtube also and um yeah i guess uh i guess this is where we're going <laughs>
guess, I guess this is the podcast now. <laughs> yeah. We're talking, Alex. We'll get out. Yeah, we'll get out of it one day. But this is this is. I was uh, I was like, that's why I was looking through your letterbox. <laughs> I was oh, like, right. so, <laughs> looking for... What's something that I could tolerate that that he would hate? <laughs> And then I just like stumbled across this and I, I don't even remember. I don't even remember. I'm going to like wind up loving these or something. Yeah, know? maybe. I mean, we both okay. might, might wind up loving <laughs> yeah. them. These might be some great films. I did to, to freedom. So yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Happy Shrek or some shit. I don't know. <laughs> Bye. Bye.